PEN HD1 Burlington, Philadelphia. A beastly media group station. Live from the Comcast Business Studios. 97.5 The Fanatic. Now, The John Kincaid Show. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5TheFanatic.com. Happy Friday, everybody in the Delaware Valley and beyond. Welcome in, John Kincaid Show. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Bob Cooney, Pat Egan, Brendan Gunn. We're going to take care of you today as John finishes up his vacation. Please He'll don't He'll be leave. back here on Monday. What'd you say? I said, please don't leave. Pat, 35 in a day today. Happy we're day not, after we're birthday. We're not doing this again. No, no we're, we're done. We're, we're done, done with your today. birthday. Yeah. We're done. Uh, fun day yesterday. Hope you had fun last night. Do anything special? Uh, went to Nate Bergazzi. <laughs> How was it? He's I, so funny. Yeah, I've yeah, only I been was, to one comedy show. I was cracking up, and uh, a couple of his openers were really funny, too. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the only downside was just getting in and out of the Wells Fargo Center is a joke. And yeah. Now the Wells Fargo Center has decided, no, we're only going to do prepaid. We're only being prepaid. So you get there, and then they, you find that out. Well, you don't have prepaid, so now I'm parking in Timbuktu. I got to get, you know, my uh, uh, my, my like visa out, and uh, I got to get my, um, what's the thing you need uh, to get in other countries? passport i gotta get my passport out i gotta start walking through checkpoints um that was the only downside yeah and it was like 35 bucks to park which is absurd but once you got in there yeah he, good laughs dude is dude is just like too funny like yeah it, it's kind of it's kind of like you think you're amusing and then you see him not cracking up at his stuff and the genius know, of people yeah. amazes me like, I've been on this little kick lately, Pat, of watching some of the the uh, uh, movies from back when my kids were little, like Toy Story, Lion King. And not that I'm watching the movie per se. I am amazed at the genius that was poured into making those movies. It's... I think comedians are kind of the same. Those guys are really, really smart to pick up what they pick up. Yeah, he had one opener that had me dying. Um, I think his name was, like, Mike Mike James... And and he 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 told this whole story, man. And I don't want to get into it, but it was I I didn't I didn't know who the guy was, so I'm not expecting right not not knowing what to expect. And he was hilarious. So saw Chuck, saw our former boss. Oh, nice. Uh, he walked by me and and uh, ignored you and just kind of he just like st he stood there, gave me the dirtiest unapproving look, and then kept walking with his wife. Yeah. So it was nice to see him. Uh huh. Um. But yeah, no, it was good night. Good night. Really good, good birthday. You were good a big part you. of that. Oh, MBG, stop. Brandon, you guys you guys all helped out. Ah, so. well deserved. Brandon, how you it. doing today? Everything good? Yeah, four more hours. I can't complain. I love my you, credit card company. My man always has the countdown <laughs> going. I love Credit it. card companies are a lot richer today. It's payday, so I can't complain. Oh, that's right, it is. There's uh there's nice. a guy there's a guy that used to work here that I miss dearly who would who would just go get me through four hours, man. Like every day. <laughs> it didn't matter if if the Eagles traded everybody. And the Phillies had just won the World Series in four hours. Yeah, just get me through four hours. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's the four hours are a lot easier when I'm in here talking to you guys Aww. opposed to out there, you know. Aww, how sweet. With, ew, I'm usually God, right. we're soft this week. Yeah, Pat yeah, we're getting all emotional. Loving email last night. No, <laughs> my text. God. It was a text. It it's wasn't just an email. nice. All right, so catching up what's going on. Uh, pretty cool driving in today. Boathouse Row lit up all over again, all reconstructed, looks beautiful. So that that was a good... The new Philadelphia. Yeah, it looks really, really good. So that was cool. I, I, I open, yes, people, I still read the paper. I get the paper delivered. It's just a habit of mine. Here's two headlines on the 76ers today. Ready? Season slipping through fingers, down and depleted. Not real good ways to describe Philadelphia 76ers when you're talking about the middle of March. Yeah, but, but sadly, it's... True, accurate. it is, and you know we know the big piece. It's Joel Embiid and the injury there. That is the main story, but God, the side pieces of 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 injuries that are happening with DeAnthony Melton and now Tyrese Maxey and Nick Batum and other guys missing. They just can't overcome it right now, and they find themselves in seventh place in the East. Uh, you had some, they had some good losses for the Sixers last night. The Pacers lost. The Heat lost. Celtics also lost, but that doesn't really matter when it comes to to uh, playoff time for the Sixers. So uh, they're back at it tonight, hosting the New Orleans Pelicans. 7 o'clock, you can hear it right here on 97.5, the Fanatic. Um, I don't know. Are we labeling must wins? Are we? Yes. Is it just is what it yes. is? They, it's must win. They're going to be. They're, because they're, you dropped two that should have been wins. And you did it because Tyrese Maxey was out, but you lost those games. You should have won those games. Looking at the stretch coming up, I don't know how many wins you have. Yeah, must win. He's out again tonight. 
Yep. Tyrese Maxey is with that concussion. So, excuse me, I assume it'll be a couple of days, a couple more games. Maybe he's back. I think Sunday they have the Knicks. Uh, Sunday, Tuesday, the back-to-back up in Madison Square Garden. So you hope that he gets it back there. So that's kind of the down news. The up news, your Philadelphia Flyers with a really good win last night. Yeah. Two-to-one win really over Florida. Win. What a really good game. It, it's funny. I'm I'm watching it, and Florida's the best team in the NHL, point-wise. Yep. And, and I'm watching. I'm saying, wow, this isn't – it wasn't like a great game if you're looking for, you know, speed and, and skill. It just wasn't that type of game last night. So I started saying to myself, wow, are the Flyers bringing Florida down to their, like, level, making them not look all that great by the way they're playing and therefore making it a tight game? And I I think that's just what they did. I think they took away some of what Florida likes to do. And then, you know, 22 seconds to go, you solve uh, Sergei Bobrovsky and you get a goal by Garnet Hathaway gets you a goal. A guy who's probably out there with 22 seconds to go just to bump, you know, make sure it keeps guys he's, off the he's puck. He's out there to not give up a goal. Exactly. And, and he winds up scoring his seventh goal of the season. And what a goal it was. Side of the net, and he takes his time. Goes from backhand, forehand, and then throws it into the net. Bobrovsky was a little bit out of place. And a defenseman sliding over. But what a great win. That's two wins against Florida for the Flyers in, like, the last two weeks. Yeah, it was a really, really gritty win. And they just – I, I – I'd like to jump out and go, well, I don't think they're bringing teams down to their level. I think maybe teams are, are overlooking them. Not at this point, man. It's March. No. And they just. You're playing for points, even if they, you're a Florida They team. know, and this is the this is the, the, the make of a John Tortorella team. They know how to defensively play a very frustrating system that is heavy on block shots, is, is heavy on back checking. And not giving an inch and being a tough team to play against. And they are that team. Yeah. And that's what John Tortorella has done his entire career. He did it in Tampa, New York. Uh, he, he did it in Columbus. And now he's doing it here where, it, look, if you don't play hard, you're not going to play. And it doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. It doesn't matter where you were drafted. You're not going to play. And, and I, I've seen it up and down his career where it's like, oh, you're getting, you know, let's say $7 million. Well, guess what? You're sitting because you're not, you're not. You're not contributing right Kim now. Kim Atkinson sat the last two games. Most, yeah, I, I, or, you I, know, I, not I, the last two, but I remember when recently. he was in New York. Like he he had a thing for like uh, Marion Gabrick. Gabrick is a, first name that me and Brendan don't know. The Gabrick guy was from a Pat. forty goal scorer, and it was like sit your ass down. Like you're not. Yeah, he does defensively there, and and their defense is depleted. I mean, through through trade, through injury. Last night, I think it was the third period. Cam York took one off the foot, knee, something, blocking another shot. And he went off up the runway, and, and you just thought, oh, my God. They, they are so depleted defensively. And then later on in the game, all of a sudden, he's back out there. And, uh, like, that's a Tortorella thing, blocking shots. All right, rub it off, you know, rub some dirt on it, get back out there. And, and that's what they do, and they've done it really well. But I think the biggest story of the night last night, at least to me, and I said it earlier this week, Sam Urson is a star, star. Pat, I have memories of somebody else that, that came in and you're like, oh, my God, this kid is unbelievably good. You uh, have to go back a ways, and it's probably before Jeff, your time. Jeff Hackett. It wasn't Jeff Hackett. That's name okay. number two that you and I don't uh, know. I'm, I'm keeping count today. Rob Zepp. It, it's a Pelly Lindbergh type thing to me. Like, Damn, that is high praise. Uh, but it is. I mean, this kid is really, really good as a rookie. And, you know, obviously he came in here. I don't know how much the Flyers knew of of where Carter Hart was going to be this year, if they anticipated, you know, the happenings that that came about. But you have a rookie in him where, I got to say, before the year was over, it was like, yeah, here's your backup goaltender. Okay. Uh, You know, I don't know. I'm not really sure who he is. This kid is really, really good. And so you might you might be onto something there, Pat, Well, if you're the Flyers. They might have a goalie of the future right there. Maybe. uh, uh, He has looked good. His save percentage is... Not not great. It's, it's not decent. great. So like just when I say that this is the carbon copy of a of a John Torello team, this is an example of that where it's a little deceiving because they don't give up too many shots, um, or they're blocking a lot of shots, or they're giving the goalie a chance to just kind of just take one in the chest and, and see it cleanly. So say I always look at save percentage. It, it's okay. It's yeah. Nine point. He's like eighty. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah he's fine. been below nine before. I think I think it would help them though is he got so much seasoning in the minors last year. So when you look at Sam Urson, it's not a situation if he's going to burn out because he played 40-something games last year in, in the AHL. 
he's had 30 something this year but getting that valuable experience you're seeing the fruits of that of of getting that ahl because i remember when uh when sergey bobrovsky ironically came into the league and he he was great like right out the gate first game like, was at tampa three... it was at florida i didn't know that they showed it last night really okay. with the flowers I yeah about that uh but the first like three months he was incredible and then all of a sudden you started to see some cracks and he started to slow down and and you know flyers fans and the owner at the time is like, oh, well, we can't, can't rely on this guy. It wasn't hard to figure out, Bobby. You looked at how many games he played the year before, and he was, like, doubling his number. He was just getting burnt out. He was hitting a wall. Uh, you don't see that happening with Sam Merson because he played 40-something games last year in the yeah. NHL. So um, I don't know if he is the, quote, goalie of the future. I, 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 want, I need to see more of him. But yeah, I, can tell you, I, can, I can tell you if this was the Elaine Vigneault system, Sam Ersan would be, be making 10 more saves a game. 10 more, and then 10 high-scoring high chances yeah. of saves a game. So. He just seems to be in the right spot an awful lot, and then when you have to come up with a big one, he makes them. So we'll see how that plays out, but he's got a fan in me so far. Eagles news, a lot of names being thrown out there. The biggest one probably, Saquon Barkley. Uh, talked about him coming in here. Man, there's a lot of I, – I, I guess this is society anymore – uh, there's just a lot of like yeah 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 want him or no way don't don't want to touch him at all. There's nobody like okay for the right price, I'd take a look at it. Man, it's it's all or nothing. It seems with Saquon Barkley. Well, let me just tell you, uh, for the right price, I would take him. Yeah. So I'll be the I'll be the uh, the one guy in the middle there. But I I have no problem taking that guy, as long as it is a friendly ish deal with it. Isn't and it probably would you. be. And it would have to be because Howie Roseman has proven. That he doesn't, it's amazing. Like, he doesn't value linebacker, obviously. He doesn't really value running back in the traditional sense, but he does. But the league doesn't either, so that's, that drives it down off exactly. the right. So when he doesn't value it and he goes out there and waits for the you know third day of the draft and second wave of free agency and stuff, like, he's able to get value where others don't because the rest of the league is treating running back like the Eagles treat linebacker. So he's been very successful because of that, because of – getting guys on, you know, either team-friendly deals or just trades that are like, geez, I can't believe we got this guy for, you know, fifth-round pick. I I don't think Saquon Barkley is going to be cheap, though. Like, I do think some teams could get enamored with, well, he was never in a good situation in New York, and he comes here. All right, we'll, we'll give him a decent amount of money. But what goes in the Eagles' favor, as I said yesterday, was the Miles Sanders contract last year. If you're, if you're the NFL, you're going to agents and saying, he was the highest-paid guy, right, and right. he ended up being the second – option and that team was terrible and he didn't make them better so yeah we're not giving a lot of money to that position right now right so we'll keep an eye on that of course the uh, free agency opens on wednesday for the nfl trade deadline by the way for the nhl is three o'clock today uh so we i have some names listed of free agents and maybe trade people that you might want we'll go over that later for your philadelphia eagles also phillies today back on the uh, back in the diamond as ranger suarez gets a start Great day. So you turn on the game. It's on at 1 o'clock on NBC Sports Philadelphia against the Astros. You turn that on, and you listen to Andrew Salchunas at the same time with the sound down on the Phillies. So you get a little taste of spring from clear. I think they're in clear water today. I'm not sure. Uh, and then you get to listen to Andrew, and, of course, the best show ever after that. 6 o'clock hour. It's brought to you by Bradford White Water Heaters. Bradford White, it's here for the pro. We often say on this show, I'm not that guy. But guess what? This team, to me, is that team. I'll talk about that. Pat has a little bit of a worry on the Philadelphia 76ers, so we'll dive into that also. A whole lot of fun to be had today here on this Friday. Welcome to the John Kincaid Show. We are here at 97.5 The Fanatic. Updates. Lacing them up one more time. I'm Brandon Gunn, and this update is brought to you by Juicy Juice. Juicy Juice is 100% juice, which means no sugar added and no artificial sweeteners. Just the full fruit flavor.
Hope you have a great day. Supposed to get some sunshine today. Unbelievable. I just looked at the uh, weather for next Friday. 70. Yeah? I can't wait. I, I like that 7 number to start, and then I like the 8s and the 9s, too. I like it hot. <laughs> All right, up. I got something for you. I saw something today that surprised me. Highest paid actor of 2023. Who do you think it was? The Rock. But no. he, wasn't, he wasn't in enough stuff. Uh, and this person made, according to this report that I saw, $73 million. They, they made that or they brought that in? Timothy Chalamet. It said uh, highest paid actor was such and such at $73 million in 2023. Chalamet's a good guess, but he's, too, he's no. still too young. Um, I will, Adam Sandler. Yes. Very good. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm not here for my looks. Even What's though Adam I'm Sandler in? Yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody on YouTube just saw what you were going to say. I don't care. Um, yeah, I, uh, he, he's got that Netflix deal. Yeah, he's right. He's got that big deal with Netflix. So, uh, I still yeah. have to see Hustle. So, I, I gotta, it's so I, good. You know, I messed up. Last Saturday night, my wife and I were going to watch a movie, and she got I think I told you guys, she got back spasms really bad. Uh, so she went in and, and, you know, did like the heating pad thing, went to bed and all that. So I was alone from like 7.30 on, and I thought, you ever have, like, some free time and your mind just starts going all over the place of, yeah. like, all the things you want to do? Like, you want to run around and eat candy and drink soda and grab a beer and, like, you know, you want to do, like, everything at once. Two or three, yeah. And I wound up doing kind of nothing. And I, I wanted to put on hustle, and I don't know why I didn't. I messed up. I, I, I done gone messed up, Pat. Yeah, you probably should see it. it what do you it... give it out of five? I really liked it. I thought it was four. I yeah. thought it was, like, the air up there meets... Um... Oh, there was another movie I compared it to, but it was it was a lot like that Kevin Bacon movie, The Air Up There. Um, and then there was I'll think of the other movie and right. tell you all fair. But um it was good, man. It was it was cool. Philadelphia angle was cool too. I mean, the only part I didn't really like that I thought was ridiculous was uh and I remember when they were filming it, I live in Roxborough and uh to see Maniunk streets without cars was absurd. <laughs> Didn't you try it's to get real. in on it? Weren't you? I was. A, oh, you were in it? Yeah, and I mean, it got you, cut or you, no, you can't see me because it's so I was all for like. I was a, in it, but you can't see. No, you can't. Uh, I was, I'm there. I, I have, hey, I have pictures. All right, so we're good. Um, I I was all for a week, and they were looking for extras. So I was like, all right, yeah, it's like it's easy, easy money. So I was during the uh, NBA scouting combine. So they just literally sat us up in stands in the stands in LaSalle, and it was great because unlike other things I've done, like they were like, oh yeah, you can bring your phone. Your so I watched Temple football while they were filming it, and then uh, the second day, do you have your SAG card? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't really need it. It costs like fifteen hundred bucks. Um, the next day I was there, I was wearing like a Sixers uh, like pullover that that the team gifted us, and the assistant coach that was supposed to, it was actually a, like a legit assistant coach for the Sixers. He had to leave early, and they had to find someone to like stand in for him. And I was the only person that somewhat fit his description, but the disappointed look nice. on the I assume he's like the third director or whatever when the production assistant brought me and was like, here's what I found for you, it was, I mean, this guy was like, really? You got the Maniunk Muggsy Bogues. And I looked at him and said, <laughs> and said, look, man, I, I play tall on camera. And he, he chuckled, and I then took a seat on the he bench. He chuckled and told you to keep well, walking. Well, like, I didn't, yeah. no, I, I didn't, he, he didn't have another option. I was, I was it, so, and I was like a stand-in. It wasn't, it wasn't like I was even going to make movies. So, um, but it was cool, though. It was cool, uh, cool experience. All right. I got some people on the YouTube talking about, yeah, it, was, it wasn't bad. It was okay. It was really good. So, mixed bag. But I think the basketball angle kind of bring me into it. And I, the local angle, too. I'm looking I'm, forward to that. I'm biased. I'm a guy that will, is a sucker for sports movies. So, if I go in, sports movies are automatically get, like, a bump up for me. And then uh, the local angle, too. I, I did like that. Yeah. That was cool. But, uh, I, yeah, I liked it. I liked it for what it was. I'm going to look really hard to see if I can try to find Pat. So you're not. I trust you're not gonna be able to. Okay. I, I was in Creed. I was in the first Creed. Yes, you, you are. See me in that. I, I remember. Yeah. I saw Creed. I, I see, did see, see Creed. I saw Creed one and Creed two. See the top of my head. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah, you got a good good head of salad there. I, I'm so I'm so in up front that it took me three times to notice. So we hear this phrase all the time. I, actually, I, I say it about myself. I'm not that guy. Uh, I, we hear this phrase in sports all the time too. Like that. Nah, that's the team you don't want to face. Not that team. Guess who that team is to me right now. I swear, what's, the what's Flyers sport? are that team. Yeah, you got to break it down to what's I sport. got you. The Flyers are that team. I think they're that team that others are looking and say, you know, they're jockeying for position and playoffs, and then they look and they say, oh, crap, we might get matched up with the Flyers. 
I really do. I, yeah. I, I went from, as I think we most of us did to follow, you went from, all right, this season means nothing. That's cool that they brought in Danny Jones or Danny Breer and Keith Jones, and they seem to have the right outlook of, not now, we're building. Foundation has to be set before we can get to where we want to go as an organization. We are not going to deter from that. They haven't. And with the trade line at 3 o'clock today, so far, they haven't deterred from that at all. It looks like they're going to give up guys to get assets, all of those things. Oh, yeah, and in the meantime, they've pretty securely put themselves in a playoff spot. And like last night, you're watching that game, and Florida is a, you know, you can argue the best team in the league. I would argue that. And and the Flyers just made them, I don't want to say look ordinary, but they made them play the Flyers game. They, and they, uh, it was, I, I'm telling I think they're that team. I, I don't want to compare it so much, but I, I don't have a better comparison to do it. But the, the devil's trap that they used to play back in the, late 90s 2000s of like you just you're slowing the game down to as you say because you have to to make it your game and that's what they do and i agree i don't think teams are going to be overly scared that they won't win a playoff series against them because there is a limit to the talent on this team but i think when teams look at it they go all right they're not going to walk it's not not going to be a cakewalk we're going to have to like really fight and you're probably looking at like a six six game series seven game series i mean the team plays really tough and They've done it against the top teams in the league, but I do like the approach that the organization's had where I feel like if this was Chuck Fletcher, instead of getting a first-round pick back, you're probably giving up a first-round pick to get right. somebody to, to do what, you know? So I think ultimately they, they have a great approach. They put themselves in a great, in a great setup where they have back-to-back years of first-round picks. I, I, I can't praise that enough. You turn Sean Walker into a first-round pick, don't, see, don't think anyone saw that coming. I think a big part of that was because he looked really good in towards his system. But it's going to be interesting to see if they if they do anything today in terms of trading anybody out or maybe getting a, you know trading a fifth or sixth or seventh round pick for for somebody. Well, they're Which probably I, going to need a defenseman. You know, while the big picture is building for the future, and we all know, and and Briere and Jones have been really good at, at telling not only us but the team that. Yeah. Look, at some point, you kind of I guess have to say, and to the only to the level Pat's saying. Uh, a late pick to bring in a guy. You got to address this defense. I mean, you you have Ristolainen's out. You have um, Drysdale's out. York took one off the foot last night. You just traded Walker. Sealers hurt. Like you have, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Well, you need bodies. And I, I, do you owe it to the team to say, all right, let's go get a a better defensive body than than a phantom guy, or do you just ride it out? No, I'm I'm calling up. Emil Andre, I'm calling up Ronnie Adderd. I'm calling up some of these Adder's younger up. guys. Yeah, that that we're sitting in Lehigh Valley and probably aren't going to be great pros. And uh, I, but like, you I'm said like up. a like, fifth not, or sixth round pick, like, like a late yeah, pick. I, no, I'm not. I don't. I'd really only trade for a goalie. Okay, I'm not really trading for anything but a goalie, and that's just to give Ursan a, a, a blow if he needs it. But that's really all I'm doing. I'm not trading for the sake of getting a body in here. That, to me, doesn't really make a ton of sense. You do have younger players for a reason. Give them a shot, and maybe you can turn that younger player into something. Yeah. Uh, who knows? But that's what I'm doing. I'm not I'm not just giving up uh, a six-round pick for, you know, somebody's third-pair defenseman because we really need D and we want to get in the playoffs. That, to me, is using an asset uh, unwisely. But if you get a veteran goalie in here, that would be a smart move on two fronts. One, you're, you're giving Ursan a break. But also, you're giving him a, a guy that he can learn from that's been in the league a little bit. I mean, Martin Jones might be out there for Toronto. Uh, they, they had Martin Jones last year, so he's familiar with Philadelphia. I don't know how much he would cost. Goalies are going to be at a premium at the deadline. But if you brought him in here, that's a guy who's played a ton of NHL games. You know, he can, he can mentor the kid a little bit, serviceable backup. Uh, that would be a move that I'd be interested in. But once again, it's got to be for the right price. If it's third yeah. round... If it's first, second, third round, I'm not doing anything. No, 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 no. You got to save that. That's what this is all about. But it's a fun spot, right, PG? I mean, you got you. You're probably going to make the playoffs. And I like John sat here and said, "I know nobody wants me to look at the numbers and we're like, or the standings." And we said, "Yeah, don't." Like just the, and and I came out a couple weeks ago and kind of half ass and I was like, "They're going to make the playoffs." Like, stop it. They're going to make the playoffs. They still might not. But you're in a great spot. If they do, there's no expectations. Yeah, none at and, all. And to me. They're a fun team to watch. Every night they're a fun team to watch. I go in, I'm excited to turn on Flyers hockey, win, loss, regardless, because the team's going to go out there and fight night in and night out. 
How many times have we seen them get blown out? Like, I, I can only count that, like, a, a handful, right? Yeah. Like, each night they're in the game. And if you would have told tell me 10 years ago that the Flyers are still in the playoff hunt and they're being sellers at the deadline and the Flyers fans are not in an uproar, I'd call you crazy. But they're, they're completely bought on bought in on uh, Danny Breer and Keith Jones's plan, which I can't complain because it's the right thing to, to buy in on. They're going to be a great team in three to five years. And it's paying off now with these guys getting great experience. Hell, you got a playoff series, that's great experience. But it, that's just icing on the cake. At it really point. is. You know, I, I don't have it. Like you said, Pat, it'll probably be a grinding series. Might go 6-7. What, but whatever happens, the experience is the first thing. Yeah. Ersan getting it is is huge. Uh, all these younger players that they have. And, you know, I, I like I, I can't get enough for the Forsters and the Tippets. Like, they're really fun to watch. So it, it's, it's a good position it's, to be in. It's amazing where this team was two years ago because I made a lot of money going online. Oh, and congratulations. Thank on you your very success. much. I really shouldn't be here. I should be on my private island that I bought because I would go on and just bet the alternative puck line for the other team. Yeah. Knowing full well that the Flyers were so checked out, they were they would roll over for the opponent and they'd get absolutely hammered. And it, I, I won way more than I lost because most times under that you know, Lane Vigneault and then it was, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank now, Mike Yo. And it was nothing against them, but, like, the players just, they weren't into it. No. And they would just go through the motions. And John Tortorella doesn't allow that, and you're, you're seeing the fruits of that this season. Yeah, I, 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 he intrigues me, like I've said all year long. John Tortorella intrigues me, and hopefully we're going to try to get a Flyers uh, person on today, but they, they're they a little bit busy. So uh, we're going to try to get somebody on next week to talk about the trade deadline, talk about maybe the, uh, the playoff push that they have coming up. Hey, it's a Fanatic Friday, and it's presented by Pump Man Philly. Pump. <laughs> For 24-7 emergency repair or pump replacement, count on Pump Man Philly, the guys to know to fix your flow. All right, when we were hitting the headlines uh, about our local sports teams at the beginning of the show, uh, I mentioned that two headlines in the paper concerning the 76ers were season slipping through fingers and down and depleted. Neither one of them wrong. And, Pat, one of your subjects for today was talking about you are Philadelphia 76ers, and are you starting to get worried that they're going to do this? What's the this? Rush Joel Embiid back to stay in the playoffs. Ooh, I, did, I, I honest to God had not even thought of that. And when I say rush him back, I mean that all the reports will say he's good to go, he's cleared, and you're going to sit there and go, man, that's, that's really weird because the recovery time was literally this, right? Like, let's say the recovery time was two months. Well, we just hit the two-month mark. When was the last time Joel Embiid was ready to go when the recovery well, time We was just up? hit the one-month mark. I'm, I'm, right? I'm, I'm oh, saying I'm sorry. I comes thought, back. Okay. You know, if they rush him back. I'm sorry. And I'm using it as a hypothetical example. I don't know what the recovery time was, but whatever it is, he, they, never, they never rush him back. He's never ready when the recovery time is set up. He's ready two, three weeks after the recovery time was, was normally put in place. And, they, and he's ready because they err on the side of caution. But they don't really have that luxury right now because time is running out. And I'm, I'm getting concerned that they will treat this scenario like they would pretty much any other player, which I don't think you can do. And they'll go, all right, well, hey, doctors clear him and he's good to go. And get out there, Joe. Save the season. All right, let and me. Normally, not to cut you off, normally I wouldn't be worried about it if it was previous years, broken finger, broken face. With ligaments, I'm way more concerned. And I yeah. think you need to err on the side of caution. And I think you need to, okay, recovery time's two months. Well, then we're doing 10 weeks. But I, I worry that it's going to be a situation where they go, look, I, he, he's good to go. He's cleared and all that. And our doctors say he's ready. And he wants to get out there, so what do you want us to do? And I'm going to go, you're, you're doing this because you're, you fell into a playoff playing game situation or clinging to that. You desperately want to make the playoffs. All right, I'll come back to you with this question, but I'll start with BG on it. So their recent play hasn't been good. And, you know, these injuries and, and everything that Pat just labeled out about where they are in standings and all that, does that make you lean? Does that make you think the Sixers may lean more towards, even if he comes back, it's not good enough, forget it, let's put him out for the season, or they're probably going to be at least a play-in team, and I think it's a play-in team. Do you do what Pat said and bring him back and go for it? See, I think the smart thing to do is just wait it out until he's completely healthy, completely conditioned, then bring him back. 
But at this point, I, I kind of think they're going to try to bring him back a little bit too soon because just listen to what Maury talks. They built the roster around Joel Embiid. So no wonder they're not playing great without their son of the universe out there because the, the rest of the roster is only built to shine when he's out there. So they truly believe they can go out there and win. To me, if they bring him back and he's not ready, it reeks of desperation not only for this season but for the window of Joel Embiid's future going forward. And it would kind of be reminiscent of a Flyers team when Ed Snyder was still alive trying to set – like sell the future to win a championship now I, I can't do that because like the flyers this year do i really believe the sixers are going to win the finals win two playoff series well, I keep going back no. no like no I, I you know and, and look they'd be in a tough spot because you you're going to have a player who wants to get out there you're going to have doctors saying he's cleared it, it i feel like it takes the adult in the room to go okay but that was an injury that he was a guard, fine, but he's a big man. He's 280. He's jumping. He's running. Like, let's think about this long term. What's best for the organization? What's best for him? Is it to get him out there or is it to wait a little bit longer, even though it's a detriment to maybe, you know, your seating or even making the playoffs at all? And I do wonder about the impact of missing the playoffs. Of If they were to miss the playoffs, are they worried that he comes to him and says, you know what, I, I – I, I did what I could. I want out. I, I don't. I. I don't know why. Maybe being down there, you know, and ta talking a little bit or whatever. I don't get that feeling. Good. I, I don't. I. Hate the I yeah. I, I think he's happy here. I think he wants to try to win here, uprooting his family and all that stuff. Look, we've we've seen the guy become a family man right in front of our eyes. Yeah. Uh, honkering down. Yeah, from up. what I hear, just just bought a a, a place in the city. Uh. So. Um. I I think he's here. Okay. Uh, I do. Um, it, it sucks, by the I way, also, that that's a fear that we have. Yeah, yeah as, but... As NBA fans, that's like, all yeah. right, we haven't won in seven minutes. When's he going to request a trade? That's how the league works. But not only to compete this year, I'm sure the Sixers want to see what he looks like with Buddy Heald and Kyle Lowry in the lineup. Well, yeah. I, yeah, so do I. Yeah, I, I do too, like, I, selfishly. I, this surrounding team is kind of interesting. I, I, I just wonder. And look, people will be, oh, it's going to be the same old story. What do you care for? Well then, you're not a, like. Well then, I'm not going to watch sports anymore. If I think that every year prior is going to lend to every year coming up, well then, you know, there's no reason the Cubs fan should ever watch baseball, and there's no reason, you know, that. But they won I, a couple of years. I, Do you I know. I, I meant back in the day. Oh well, clarify. Well, yeah. Well, you're talking goats from years ago. So it's also nine years ago at this point, right? Yeah. So eight I, years ago, like yeah. with Buddy Heald, Kyle Lowry in a starting lineup. I, well, I rolled my eyes at it more than anybody about, really? It, it, it's a, it was a 37-year-old point guard that you had to bring in here to, to kind of, like, see things through. But I, I would like to see this whole team together because we never saw it this year. And one of the things that made me cringe a little bit, Nick Nurse said, look, in 2017 when, I, when they won the championship, 17 or 19, whatever year it was. 19. 19. 19. When they won the championships with Toronto, he said, my starters only played 56 minutes together going into the playoffs. So... No, I don't. I don't want to hear that. Like that, I don't know. Uh, but I do think this team's a little interesting. I'll just say I'd like to see them play all together. See what it is. See a Kyle Lowry throwing everybody around, getting everybody in proper spots, including Tyrese Maxey, including Joel Embiid. See how that all played out. But I don't know if we're going to get a chance to do it or not. Uh, yeah, this team is light years better with Joel Embiid. That's not breaking news. And oh God, makes everybody no. around yeah. him better and all that. So uh, I, I think. My ire right now towards Buddy Heald would probably be pushed to the side if Joel Embiid's out there because he is going to create so much attention that it's going to open up Buddy, Buddy Heald in the corner to, to, to knock down those threes. And I, I think Kyle Lowry can still find guys in the open, in the open court and, and facilitate. And I think, you know, we saw what Joel Embiid did for James Harden and vice versa. Um, I, I also think that, you know, getting Tyrese Maxey back out whenever he's cleared, I think working with a Kyle Lowry is going to do him some good. You yeah. Know, talked about that. He, you work with Kyle Lowry one season. You got, you know, James Harden last season. It's, you know, for a guy that you might be looking to develop as a point guard or, or at least a combo guard, I think that goes a long way. Yeah, I, I, selfishly as a fan, I want to see Joel Embiid out there. Sure. Because this product that I'm watching is is not great. I mean, I'm watching a team that's either getting hammered by 20 or blowing, you know, double-digit leads in the fourth quarter, and I'll sit there at the end of the game as, you know, the final score ticks down, and I go, why did I expect him to win anyway? Well, because they, they entered the fourth quarter up like 12, whatever it is. You right? got to reset the expectations it, when you're up 12 dude, going into the fourth. It sucks because you sit down and you go, all right, they're, they're without everybody. 
So and, and so is Fur- the other team. Yeah, they're throwing out Furkan Aldemir, and you know they're throwing out you know, uh, know I- Isaiah Cannon. And all right, you know I'll watch it, but I'm not going to enjoy it. And then third quarter, you're like, I'm enjoying this. All right, let's go. And then you know the wheels fall off, and it sucks. So selfishly as a fan, yeah, I want to see him, but I do think that there's a long term, long term goal here that's winning a championship, and is what Brendan Gunn said. I think if you ask every Sixers fan out there, hey, is this the year? The answer is sadly no. Of, yeah, of and course. And previous years it was, Maybe. yeah, okay, if they have the you know seating and the matchup and all that, and this goes right. You could at least see a path to an NBA championship. But they never got it, so maybe it's the pathless way to go that will be better for them. The road less traveled, as yes. you said. It's funny you brought Could up be. with Kate Scott yesterday. She said she doesn't want the playing tournament, but you had a devil's advocate view on it. It's more game. An extra game. or like If that's what it takes to get Embiid back for at least one or two games just to see him play with those guys, I'm not opposed to that yeah, somebody... because I don't believe they're winning a championship, so I want to see what he looks like at least. Right. So, somebody questioned me on that yesterday on YouTube. They're like, why do you say games? It would only be a play-in game. Isn't there a chance you can play to and, st- and, and come out of it? Well, I've never been in the situation. The either. lower seed has to win lo- twice, I thought. The, right. The higher seed has to win once. Exactly. So if they're the lowest seed and they got to win twice, that's two games with Embiid. Yeah, that's a look. That that's oh. trying to look for a positive in a yeah, it's playing in a <laughs> yeah a mountain of mediocrity. But we'll see how that all plays why, out. Why we- does Adam Silver do this stuff? Like, why is he trying to reinvent the wheel? Playing tournaments, in season tournaments, in season tournaments. Am I the only one that thinks like this is just all of it's really really dumb and? No, we, we, when we talked about the gimmicky. in-season tournament, how stupid it's so it was. It's so gimmicky. It's so incredibly, it screams big three. But, Bob, the numbers, everybody watched it. Everybody everybody watched the highest thing and people on red carpets and stuff. Like, I just, <laughs> I, it, it's, it's absurd. <laughs> it's absurd to me. Like, Adam Silver, what do you, it's as if he gets bored and he goes, yeah, I, I got to do something with this. Yeah, game. some different idea. Like, All right, in-season tournament, in, in play in tournaments. Yeah, play in, they're a seven seed. They're already in. Yeah, the, your your immediate problems need to be addressed first, and that's the health and availability of your star players in the league. And they tried to do it with the sixty five game thing and all that, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm done with playing tournaments and, and in season it, tournaments. Like, yeah, we were done with it when it why, was going yeah, on. Why, why, was it broken? I must I must have missed when it was broken and need to get fixed. It wasn't broken to me. I don't know. No, it was. Maybe I'm weird. Hey, friend of the show, Jim Curtin, your union head coach, will be joining us at nine a.m. today. Uh, We have a whole bunch more Eagles, Sixers, Flyers, Phillies talk ahead for you. Also, that high school uh, basketball uh, problem has really taken a life of its own, and it's grown really big. I want to get your guys' thoughts on it, and and if you're out there and and have a feeling on it, 610-632-0975, we'll get into that a little bit uh, here on this great Friday, a little bit of sadness here in the offices as our as our sales executive mbg it's her last day here so we're going to say a fond farewell to her but come back and join us here on the john kincaid show here on 97.5 the fanatic fanatic sports update one more year i'm brendan gunn and this update is brought to you by bradford white water heaters when you need a new water heater choose one that is built
Live from the Comcast Business Studios, powering possibilities. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5TheFanatic.com. The John Kincaid Show with Bob Cooney and Pat Egan continues. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5TheFanatic.com. Welcome back. Happy Friday, everybody. John Kincaid Show here at 97.5 The Fanatic. Right early Friday morning, sun shining, Pat. I had to go to the window just to look at it. I forgot what sunshine was like. It's bright. It's bright. Yeah. It, it makes you, when you stand at that window and the sun shines just right on you, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's model like. Look like Robert Downey Jr. You do. In the right lighting. In the right lighting. Like a short... That's what they say. Yeah, that's what a lot of people are saying it. The people, people on YouTube, people on my I tweets. Didn't, I, what, what was that about? That have, is, do people really say that about you? I don't know. I was walking around the Wells Fargo Center yesterday and people were like, hey, RDJ. Iron no, Man. No, nah, man, not me. Iron Sorry. Man. Iron Man. Get it all the time, man. Not me. Appreciate it, though. Thank you. Just something people say. PG, anybody ever tell you you look like anyone? You got a little Claude Giroux in you, I think. I get that. I get, unfortunately, no, I... Carson Wentz's weirdo self. I get, like, Prince Harry sometimes. Prince Harry, I see. Sometimes, like, Jesus, Prince some Harry. people say. Jesus. Why no, I don't see I haven't that. run into Jesus lately, uh, so I don't know if you Prince look like. Harry, I see. I'll, I said it before. Ray Dunn. Looks exactly like Connor McDavid. Yeah, oh, was that you, right? You said that one time, that. and he Look looks exactly McDavid, like him. And it is scary how much Ray Dunn yeah, looks like. Yeah, I, I never McDavid. noticed until you said something. They're identical. And Ray Dunn is the Connor McDavid of humans. Great guy. I mean, just otherworldly. Yeah, Ray Put Dunn's up 100 cool. points. So, uh, yeah, but he. Uh, what about you? Do you ever get any, like, celebrity? Yeah. So, uh, I may have. You may have heard this story before. I don't think Connor did, and maybe some of the listeners didn't. Well, Connor's so, not here, so. One of my. Did I say Connor? Yeah, man, it's Brandon. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Brandon. Sorry, I'm babe. sorry. It's pop up. It's look, happened. I have my look shirt on, my, on over look here. On my I'm screen. clearly Brandon. <laughs> Wait a second. Look on my screen. It says Con I have. What do I have up on my screen? That's why I said Connor. I have Connor McDavid up on my screen. Uh, so one of my kids is just about to start school. My oldest, Bobby, take him out to buy shoes for him. So we walk into the place, and you know I'm holding his hand. The guy that works there comes running up. He's like, "Hey, Bob, how you doing?" I was like, "Good. How are you?" And he's like, "Good, good. Whatever help you need, you know, let me know. What are you looking for?" And this. And I'm like, wow, this guy's being awfully nice. And I'm thinking, Daily News Live, maybe? I don't know. So we're trying things on, and this guy is, like, jumping over people to get to me to help me. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Finally, so, I'm getting the respect in the city that I deserve. Yes. Yeah, so I find the shoes. I go up to pay for them, all that stuff. It was like that commercial. The guy looks at my cart and goes, oh. I said, what's up? He goes, I thought you were Bobby Clark. <laughs> I said, no. Nah. I, I have my well, Like, the disappointment on his face, you know, it, it was registered <laughs> deeply. So I have gotten Clark once in a while. I uh, can see that a little bit. Not real. No, not really. I, 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 had a, I had a mother of one of my friends in high school that used to think I looked like Kevin Bacon, I guess, a long time ago back in the day. No. All right. Look, the reality wow, is we Connor don't... McDavid and Ray Dunn, though, that is a good one. We don't look like celebrities. That's why we're doing radio. That's right. Great point. Let's not forget that. Andrew's a good-looking dude, though. Andrew could get by with his looks. 610-632-0975. Yeah. Well, that's just the way I feel. <laughs> All right, Pat, it's going to be an interesting time uh, with the Eagles up until uh, uh, free agency comes about next week. It already has been an interesting time. There's a lot of names being thrown around. But you ask a question about Howie and trust and positions. <laughs> kind of. You know what, what I mean. mean? Yeah. I mean positions it's, on the it's, football it's field. It's gotten Pat. weird. Um, first you're hitting on Andrew, and now you're talking about position groups. But with the free agency coming up in the draft and whatnot, is there, is there a particular position group, because this team needs a lot right now, that you have the utmost confidence in Howie Roseman addressing? Because there's one, there's one obvious one to me where I immediately go, I don't worry about that, that, that group because Howie's going to find, not only is he going to find somebody, he's going to find like somebody good. Is there one for you? I or Brennan? Or, or I neither? would assume that they go hand in hand with the coaching too. So I'll say offensive linemen. I mean I, I, there's no wrong answers. I'm just because if opinion. you look at it, you, you, you took a guy that never played football and he's your starting left tackle. You just had a although he didn't take him, but you had a center who just retired a Hall of Famer that was taken in the sixth round. Um no, how he took how he took uh Mylotta? No, I know. I was talking about the – after my lot, I was talking about Jason Kelsey okay. saying that you had a, a six-round pick. I apologize. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so, like, that directly to me goes to Jeff Stoutland. 
So does he go to Stalin and say, hey, who do you like? And then it looks better. I guess my most trust, yeah, would be offensive linemen. All right, Brennan, you got one? I mean, this offseason in particular, I think there's a lot of safeties out there, and he's had success, you know, bringing a couple in, but this past year was awful. So I don't know if I'll go that direction. Cornerbacks. Yeah, if there's not one, you can say there's not one. I don't know. Like, I expect them to go out there and get some key pieces, but I don't know if I necessarily trust him at one in particular position group. Are you going to say running back? Running back. Okay. I have the utmost confidence in my head. that this dude will be able to find not only a cheap running back, but a really good running back for the third straight year in a row because he just he finds that value where other teams don't. And I do think it's something that you said earlier that the league treats running back like the Eagles treat linebacker. They don't value it so much that they're willing to let guys walk or they're willing to just let guys go that are on their last year they're contracting. Okay, yeah, give us a fifth-round pick, sixth-round pick, and then they come to Philadelphia, and DeAndre Swift's looking to cash in now, whereas previously, like, he was, you know, a second-class citizen in, 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 uh, in, in Detroit. Like, he was an afterthought. And then he comes to Philly, they make him a priority, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, that's the guy that Detroit thought they were getting when they took him in the second round of the draft. You know, the Jordan Howard trade, the Jay Ajayi trade six years ago, whatever it was. You know, and in between, you were able to find running backs, you know, Miles Sanders in the second round. LeGarrette Blunt, he brought it. LeGarrette Blunt, yeah, it was, it was, a, was a second wave free agency. I mean, they've been able to, to bring in these guys. You know, Darren Sproles, another one, and, and the list goes on, We really. found Boston Scott on waivers late in the season. Yeah, and, and, and that guy is going to end as an, an all-time Eagle great. When he retires, we're going to have a Jason Kelsey-like speech for Boston Scott. But, no, it's, in all seriousness, like with Boston Scott, like that's a nice find considering he's been on the team for, like, six years. So, I... I have the utmost confidence in that dude just getting it done. I don't know who the guy's going to be, but he's proven to me that he's able to find good running backs, and he's able to find them cheap. And you plug and play that position, and maybe it is the offensive line. Maybe that's a big part of it. I'm sure it is. They, they're, they're, these running backs are running behind one of the best offensive lines of football. But it's just time and time again, it's, it's not just one running back, too. It'll be like a running back by committee, running back timeshare, and whether it be getting a Miles Sanders in the draft – or trades like the ones we talked about, I got a lot of faith in him to get it done. Is it easy? Is that the easiest position to address right now if you're a GM in the NFL? Because so many teams devalued that position, I, I, because there's so many available, because you're going to look good signing somebody? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's the easiest Was position. DeAndre Swift, I, I love this topic, Pat. Was DeAndre Swift better with the Eagles than we thought he was going to be? For me, yeah, I I, okay. didn't, I thought he was a change of pace. I'm back. being an it's an yeah, honest I, question. I, I, I thought he was a complete change of pace back. I did I I didn't hate the move when they made it, but I just didn't think he was going to be. Oh, a number, that's right. A you were one, that. Way. I didn't think he was going to be a number one back. And he right. Proved me yeah, wrong. I was, was on awesome. the air with you uh, in the summer when they traded for him yeah. during the draft, and yeah, you liked him as a change of pace back, but you thought Miles Sanders was head and shoulders above that. Yeah, uh, boy, was I wrong. So uh, if, if there's one thing that that, he, that Cowie Roseman's proven it's that he can find a running back and the one thing that I've proven is I don't know football and no I and to and to further your point let's look at it if you go back to uh Jay Ajayi LeGarrette Blunt, they they want they help win you a Super Bowl and they were pretty much done after that right Jay Ajayi was young Jay, but Jay he Ajayi had, was pretty much yeah shot. yeah yeah and and LeGarrette Blunt was at the end of his career so that worked hey. out well for them right he went to the Lions then they jumped uh well let's go back also Darren Sproles you got here like a fifth uh, round pick yeah and and like you know, you got him at a good price, and he helped you out an awful lot. Uh, bump it up to my – who was right before Miles Sanders? Oh, you, uh, Jordan Howard was another – who gave you decent – Yeah, I looked at uh, myself for Jordan Howard. I, so did I. But then you brought in uh, uh, Miles Sanders with the second-round pick. You got everything out of him probably that you wanted to get out of him. And he was explosive, and he averaged over five yards a carry. And in an offense where, yeah, you're going to be pass heavy, he gave you exactly what you wanted from a running back probably. Jump ahead now to to DeAndre Swift. As you said, got more out of him than you were expecting. Yeah. Uh, it has to be more than they were expecting because they didn't even have him starting coming out of training camp. So, yeah, you, you're exactly right. You're exactly right with this. Yeah, he, they just, they've been able to grind out really, really good acquisitions when it comes to that one position where I can't remember the, the bad ones, really. Like, I know that they've been in there. I know that there have been a couple backs that they brought in where it's like you don't really do much. But when that running back, whoever it is that I'm drawing a blank on, isn't great. Like Kenny Gainwell is a good example, but he was a fifth-round pick. But 
you throw him out there as a starter, he's not great. But you you have a backup plan in in um, yeah, Andre Swift. Swift. Yeah, you, like you traded for him. So you they've never been they've never put themselves in a position where they don't have a contingency plan. And no, and th that whole room got paid $3 million last year. Boston Scott was your highest paid running back in the room, and he's the one who got the least carries. Like, they don't... It's crazy. What concerns me, though, is they see the success of a uh, San Fran going out and paying a Christian McCaffrey. Do they try to replicate that? I know we see the rumors yesterday with Saquon Barkley we talked about in the opening. I don't want them to go out there and overspend on a running back to get a guy in here, but... No, you know, I, it's I, funny. I don't think they will. That's the thing. Like, I think, I think Howie has basically made his bones with getting these guys cheap, whether it be the price he's paying to bring them in or the price he actually has to pay them on the open market. And usually it's the second wave of free agency. The amount of running backs that are out there right now, I would be absolutely stunned if he went out there and addressed the running back position in the first wave of free agency because I think he's going to wait it out. And basically, just take the best of. Well, I think all the running backs are going to get weighted out. I, honestly, yeah, I, I think I think there'll be like one or two that do sign, but I think he's pretty much just going to wait, 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 and then there's going to be some really good running back that's still out there that we're going to be asking Schefter about in July. Of what, what's the latest with this guy? And then you know, come August before training camp, the Eagles sign him to like a one year deal, prove it deal, like kind of like what we're waiting to do with Snell and Montgomery. And I think that they're going to be able to to cash in on that because if you're Howard Roseman too. You can go to free agent running backs and go, look, not only have we had success at your position, we've had success with different running backs in multiple years, and a big part of it is the offensive line. Yeah, assuming, I mean, we saw Miles Sanders get, what, $8 million last year, highest paid running back on the open market. Yeah. DeAndre Swift's going to get paid a little bit, so you can convince a free agent running back, hell, come in here on a one-year deal, and you're probably going to get paid behind this offensive line. No, we lost Kelsey. It should yeah. still be good, and this offense should be in the top five, top ten. Yeah, losing, losing Kelsey is obviously huge and unfortunate. It's going to affect your offensive line, but the case can still be made. Like, hey, like we'll, we'll make you a really good running back. We took DeAndre Swift from you know, 500 yards to like 1,300. So uh, I, I think that they're going to be able to take advantage of a market that never materializes for a lot of these running backs. And we're going to be going in next season going, how the hell do we get this guy at this price? It's funny that we're talking running backs when the biggest holes are obviously on the other side of the ball. Like, that's a luxury. And maybe how he approaches it as such, like you said, Pat, waited out, second wave of free agency, all of those things. The Barkley thing is intriguing. Um... Uh, one of the things I heard nationally was a comparison to Christian McCaffrey, saying that he wants to go back to what the way that the Giants used him his first year, which was more of a Christian McCaffrey type, where he ran the ball and caught the ball an awful lot out of the backfield. If you can get that kind of guy, if you can get you know a Saquon Barkley to buy into that, and maybe a Kellen Moore has an offense where you do throw the to the running back a little bit. What's more. the most you'd be willing to spend on a Barkley? Like how much cap would you want to give to the running back? To, to me, like, um, or I, I was going to say five or six. I might go that high. I'm not, I'm probably look, and I think that Howie probably looks at it like you talked about, Brennan, with the running back room. How much is the running back room costing? What's my max that I want to pay for that room? And the room is still really cheap, which is going to help out if he does end up taking that approach. Not looking at it like how much is one, one particular player going to cost me, but. The room as a whole, can I fill that room for $7 million where I'm getting one of the premier running backs in the league? Or do I go what I did last year and go $3 million, get a really good running back in here that I think can contribute and have a really good season, and then I can allocate that money elsewhere? I, I Yeah, Bob's right. Like They need all the, the things they need are pretty much on the other side of the football. Yeah, like if we nickel and dime Reddick and then we go over spend on a running back yeah, and it dumb. comes out that Reddick gets, you know, what, $3 million more than we were willing to offer and that goes to a running back, that's going to leave a bad taste in my mouth. Not going to go over well with the fan base, I'd assume. No, but yeah, you do have to look at the other side of the ball. So let me throw some names out at you that, that have become kind of popular talking points here uh, with the Eagles and what they may need. Xavier McKinney stands to make somewhere between 14 and $18 million. Uh, only 24 years old. What are you thinking? Yes or no? Just yes or no on these, not just yes or no, but yes or no on these guys that I'm going to mention to you. I have about a handful. Yes. At that money, 14 to 18. Is that, that the cap hit? That looks like it's, it's going to, what it's going to take somewhere between there 
Yeah, to get you him. Does that prohibit me from bringing Reddick back? And that's gonna be I my, don't know. That's going to be I my mean, question with everything. To figure out, right? Well, if, if the answer is I don't know, then I'm, my answer is going to be no for every single person. Yeah, I'm in. probably going to say no on McKinney just because he's going to get the highest paid in the he's safety go- market. And that is. safety market, there's like 30 to 40 guys that are hell names as far as NFL fans go. Some of her on the older side, I would want a younger safety. But you're not telling me a Chauncey Gardner Johnson's not going to be maybe half the price of that? Yeah, the more, yeah, I, I initially went, yeah, but no. Um, because of everything you just laid out, and then also I, I don't want to. That's so funny you said that because I had yes and then put slash no. Yeah, the the fear that I have over spending on someone else and letting Reddick go is like every name you mention. I'm gonna be thinking, how does it affect Reddick? Because I want him back so badly yeah. that I I, I don't want to be sitting in a situation where they're over they're getting the highest paid blah 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 blah. And it's like yeah, that's cool. They're gonna need that guy because you have no friggin' pass rush. So, yeah, the quarterback's going to have all day to throw back there. So, good thing you got the highest paid safety. He's going to be working a lot. <laughs> How about Eddie Jackson? Chicago Bears released him, 30 years old. Has been injury riddled over the last couple of years. He's my backup option. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally sold on. That reeks to me of what they've been doing lately. Great point. Yeah, but in, and there's also the Fangio aspect, too. Fangio directly. Yes, there is. I, I, yeah, he's like a backup option to me, and it's really just a backup option because I think he'd be cheap because of the fact that he was released and the injuries and whatnot. But I don't think he's re- a realistic option for the Eagles because if you just released Avante Max because of injury history, it wasn't talent. It was it was because the guys can't stay healthy, and they may bring so him back. they might. But yeah. to but to release him and then go, oh, okay, Eddie Jackson, br- come on in. That to me is it's. Kind of dumb. It's a super win now move, and it would have to pay off to work. I think there's other guys out there that can stay healthy and are younger, and I would get him maybe if no one if the market doesn't develop for him, bring him in late. But I'm not going to him on the first couple of days of free agency, the second wave of it. That's a guy I sit back and wait on. Justin Simmons, now a guy he's also 30 years old. Surprise cut by the Denver Broncos this week. Uh, Vic Fangio, familiar familiarity, yeah. ton of it. Um, I like I, him a lot. I have a yes for him. Um, is that a second wave guy for you, Pat? He's 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 better to me than that. Oh, you're just signing some thirty year old yeah, to bring look, him in and play. He's, he's better than that for me. He's really good. But Brennan mentioned the name that I, I go like that's my guy, and it's CJ GJ. Oh, that was the, that, that's the very next name so, that I have on the list. Every name that you brought up, it's since Brandon mentioned, reminded me that yeah, there's there's he's out there. It's like I I think that's the option because you have to factor in that Sidney Brown is going to be coming back and he's going to probably take a safety spot. I hope so. God, so you I really, hope so. You need one safety, and then you pair him with Reed Blankenship. And you should be set. You should be good. But you need one really good safety, one competent guy. I'm higher on Reed Blankenship than a lot of people. But Sidney Brown comes back post-injury. Hopefully, in a year from now, you're looking at your starting safety tandem as CJGJ and and Sidney Brown. For years to come. Yeah, like it's – but I I keep going back to CJGJ, and and I don't think he's going to cost you nearly as much as a lot of the guys you've mentioned. Uh, but I, I do. I really like Simmons. It's funny doing this exercise, depending on which way the Eagles go, you can tell what their mindset is. If they're going out there and getting these 30 plus year old guys, they're trying to win now and they're kind of going all in. If they get a younger guy, they're building for now and the future. So I'm interested to see what they do at this time next they, week. They I think it's going to be a blend of both. Yeah, they, it should be a blend of both, but they need to go all in. Like the window's open. You, you know, fix that defense, one. you're right back to it. You know, you're like fixing it. You just need to get it back to like competency, because they weren't that. Yeah, if last you had a top were, fifteen defense, top fifteen to twenty, you're winning a playoff game or two. Yeah, you instead were, you had the worst defense in the league. You were a joke last year. They were they were lost. So I mean, if you can get a pass rush in there, and you know you can get some like age just guy that knows how to play linebacker, you changes things drastically for you. Yeah, and, and and we talked about it before. Let's not forget this offense is made to outscore teams. So competent defense, Pat, I think you're you're spot on. And with a Vic Fangio, that probably takes you up to competent, no matter the talent level that you it, have, although there are plenty of holes to it, fill. It changes things so, so much. And when you look back at the, you know, two years ago when they went to the Super Bowl, when you have your offense go out there, 
they score first possession. Your defense forces a three and out. The offense scores again, and now you've dug your opponent a 14-point hole. It changes their game plan yeah. completely. And now you're able to, you know, I hate this term, but pin your ears back and just get after the quarterback. And it, like it, They weren't able to do that last year. They were a mess. And it was a little bit on the offensive side of the ball because Brian Johnson was horrible. But then the, the defense was, if, if not worse. So you get competent competency on both sides of the football, and it's going to change things a lot for this team. It certainly will. 7 o'clock hour, it's brought to you by the all-new Bet Parks app. Sportsbook and Casino in one sleek, easy-to-use app in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. When we get back here on the John Kincaid Show, uh, I, I, I'm a little upset with myself. I've brought it up a little bit before, but now it's coming more to fruition. I, I've lost interest in something, and it, and it really disappoints me, and it scares me. Also, Brendan and I, we have some troubles. We have some anxiety over what a couple of of 76ers have said in recent days. All that uh, and more me. here on the John Kincaid Show, no, 97.5, different. the Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. One more year. I'm Brendan Gunn, and this update is brought to you by Christian. Another chilly shower? The plumbing experts at Christian have the fix. A tankless water heater upgrade. Save $400 instantly on installation. Call 833-842-1989. Get endless hot showers. While appearing on... Uh, Takeoff with John Clark, Brandon Graham announced that he'll be returning to the NFL for one final season. Derek Gunn reports that BG and the Eagles are in negotiations on a one-year deal to see the Super Bowl 52 hero call it a career in Philadelphia after next season. In other Birds news, there's been rumors swirling of a potential interest in Saquon Barkley. Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds joined the best show ever yesterday, and he said maybe, but only at the right price. I don't see the...
back. John Kincaid Show here, 97.5 The Fanatic. Bob Cooney, Pat Egan, Brendan Gunn. Brendan Pachilli back there answering some phones, getting our YouTube done. He's doing two things at once. Well, we got the star over there. What's, and we got the star here. MBG is in the house. He's doing two things at once and you don't have to hear about it. Day. He's doing two things at once on a day that he's supposed to be here, you know, just doing one thing. Now, MBG is here today. Mary Beth's last day of work here at the station. It's big to us, I know. Um, but what do you what do you do on your last day at a job when you know it? I've never nothing. I, yeah, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think she's kind of hit that stride oh. like on Tuesday of this week. Mail it in. Yeah, yeah say your goodbyes and call it a day. Hasn't been a lot of uh, I, her fingers aren't like sh stressed from too much work over the last few days. So yeah, MBG is uh, in the house our last day with her. So um, she's going to be here joining us for the rest of the day, which is cool. We have Jim Curtin coming on at nine o'clock. You know what I love about Jim? Uh, not only is he a, a, a great coach, I like watching him on the sidelines, his demeanor, which I talked about earlier this week. Uh, but he's just a Philly sports fan through and through. And so I'm anxious to get his take on the on the Jason Kelsey stuff, on all things Philadelphia. And he's had a real busy schedule with the CONCACAF uh, going on, along with their regular MLS schedule. So I believe next week he will go to close to Mexico City um, to play in their CONCACAF game. It'll, it'll be a winner-take-all because it's an aggregate scoring, Pat, and the first game was nil-nil. I'm not a huge fan of that. You're Ag not, the aggregate scoring. Yeah, it's only in the CONCACAF thing. I don't, I don't love it either. Yeah, I whatever. mean, you know. But soccer has different rules. It's just, you know. It's different. It's different. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good change of pace, I guess. It is a good change of pace. All right, listen, yesterday I'm on um, – you guys know that I'm I'm pretty like knee deep into into high school South Jersey sports and all. So you have the big controversy with the state semifinal game where Camden High was awarded the win after the kid put the the shot in before the buzzer. Well, yesterday it grew bigger and bigger and bigger. People caught that. Um, all right, Manasquan hired a law firm to uh, uh, go against the ruling that they lost the game. Uh, it was like thrown out almost immediately. Uh, uh, so that's not going to happen. Dick Vital gets on, and he's a Jersey guy, gets on uh, Twitter saying, this is ridiculous, I can't believe this. It has gone national. And people calling for Camden to say, all right, you know what, we didn't win that game, let Manasquan play. I just want your guys' thoughts on it. Because like I said yesterday, this is these are high school kids. This is a learning lesson, both for Manasquan, Camden High, for, for so many people. As a parent, I would have to learn how to, how to you know, console my kid or move my kid forward after maybe a win was taken away from him uh i i don't know i'm not, I'm not going to pretend to have answers but what would you guys do you're the head coach of the team that was awarded the win when it's obvious you shouldn't have been awarded the win do you do anything different except move on because i gotta tell you i i think i would just move on as much as i feel bad I would have to because I don't want to take things away from my kids, even though they were given something they probably didn't deserve. Yeah, hey, man, Esquan, we'll win in your honor. <laughs> we're we're going to go you know in the state a, championship. That's not a bad you. answer. We're going to go do it, and then you can claim you're the champion at that point. We'll have the trophy. We're, we'll have the hardware to show for it. But in your heart of hearts, I guess, back in your, your local hometown, you can say you're the state champions. I would take a team vote uh, what the team wants to do. I'd assume the team wants to play. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that might be. But unanimous. I, I'd take a team vote. But if they if they're gonna want to play, look, um, I'm getting tired of this story. Uh, quite frankly, are you? Yeah, I'm getting very tired of it. This is life, kids. It's not fair. Things suck. All right, it's unfortunate, and it is. And all these kids are gonna sit there and they're gonna think about it for the rest of their lives. And I get that. Okay, this is life. Sometimes you get passed over because you know Joey's cousin just graduated and you know he gets the promotion and you didn't and it's not fair and you're more qualified but guess what that is life so unfortunately these kids learned a really crappy life lesson early yeah. and they're gonna sit with it and they're gonna think about it for the entire their entire lifetime about this moment that sometimes it doesn't go your way and it isn't fair it's but it, that is legitimately life my career was stymied because I I, I went into my first uh, my first um, uh, which one call it? Uh, interview, and I like basically like, didn't put it on the table. I was like too humble. I was by far the most qualified guy to be hired here, but the guy hiring at the time, who is not here anymore, that's why I'm saying it, decided like, oh, well, no, he's not a good fit. So I, I had to like wallow away. Like wasn't fair. I was the most qualified by far. wasn't even close. 
I didn't get hired because he liked the two other guys better. Because I didn't fit his mold of what he wants. Like, it happens. Yeah. All right? It, I don't know what to tell you, kids. Like, this isn't a part... Th this is what drives me nuts is... Uh, from the same people that want it reversed are the same people that will bitch and moan about participation trophies. Oh, there's all, all these kids, you know, the participation trophy. Went. You want to give them a participation trophy now. Is it fair? No. Did the other team win? Yes. Move on. Like, yeah. They got a game to play. Move the F on and get over it. We're hiring law firms? A waste of taxpayer money. Yeah, I thought that was a little bit of a that was of crossing line. the line. Yeah. Waste that, of that's taxpayer too much. Money. Yeah, especially that's a joke. Especially when the talk was at the beginning of, uh, you know, why don't all schools just get cameras on the scoreboard so you can review it all the time? Because they can't time? afford it. Because they can't afford it. But then you get Manasquan going, and then they can't afford to hire a law firm <laughs> over to try a to basketball take this, game to try to take this to court. Yeah, so it, it's just you know what's different about it, Pat. And I, I agree with you. Like life lessons, yeah. The, the difference is our life lessons, and you're a lot younger than me. If you were in this situation in high school, it wouldn't be as out there as it's on camera. It's on film. Everybody yeah. can see it. Well, that's the it thing, was, though. Like, it, I, I talked about the other day. We lost a state a similar state semifinal basketball game when I missed a sh You know, not because I missed a shot, but in that game late, I missed a shot. Well, one of our guys got called for a travel earlier. And it was the worst call I've ever seen, and we would have gone up and maybe won the state championship that year. We still talk about that. It sucks. But there's no – we don't have it on camera. We don't have it on our phones. It wasn't talked about in the papers or anything like that because only the people there that saw it could complain about it. You know, so it's a different year with these kids now. At the so end of the day, lesson, though – Lesson learned, real quick, Brennan. Lesson learned is different way of teaching because of – being reminder. known it, exactly the rules are the rules though we saw it in the nfl a team got robbed on camera yeah. we all saw it, it the, if the rules are in place you can't go against the rules afterwards like it, we all saw the the saints get pass interference against against the rams guess what they can't overturn it because the rule is the rule in place if you want to go change the rules after this Go ahead. But the rule was, yeah. if the refs leave the court and they call the other team the winners, they're the winners. They, That's what it is. To Bob's point, yes, it is on video. The only people that are re-watching this video are those that want to show that they were screwed. Because the team that won, and I use that in quotation marks, the teams that are air quotes, the, teams that, the team that won, they're not going to show this to people. So really the only people that will ever actually like bring this up on their phones unprompted at a bar are the people yeah. that got screwed over. When Camden goes on and wins it, and there's a banner hanging in Camden's gym, the 2024 champions, do you think in 25 years people are going to be like, eh, not so fast. Some local people will, but when a random kid playing in high school no, in 25 years care. sees that up, Camden's the, the state champion. I think it's more than just the people that got screwed. I think it's a national thing where you're, you're a follower of sports. If this happened in Kansas somewhere. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying the people that were directly involved in this story. Oh, okay, yeah. The people that you go, all right, well, the life lesson's a little bit different. No, like, if this happened to me, I'm, not, I'm never watching that video. Why would I? What's the benefit of me watching that video to get pissed off? Like, I don't mean to be callous about this, but, like, this is, like, three, four days and nothing's changing. I hate to it's break that. It's not changing, I no. hate to break that to literally everybody out there. It's not changing. We're not going to go back and do kumbaya. We're not going to replay the game. Guess what? What's, what's the team that, like, a, a one that ended Manusquan. up winning? Manasquan. Guess what? Manasquan's going to play. So get the hell over it. it. Move on. There are bigger issues here. Yeah. Manusquan's not going to play. Camden's going to play. That's what, that's what I'm saying. I'm so saying. Yeah, Manus, I'm sorry, yeah. I thought you said Manusquan won. Manusquan should have won. Camden okay, was right. awarded the, yeah, the win. Camden's yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah, Camden's going to play. Yeah, you know, you, you just hope the kids can move on. The Manusquan kids can move on. Yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, they there's will. nothing you can do about it now. They'll live their uh, life. Will it entice change in high school basketball? I, I don't know. But I, I do Delphi. find it, I it, in this day and age, that it has become a, a national story simply because of the capabilities of of uh, video, phones, all of those things. So I, I guess my big gripe with it at this point in, in the stage, because I do feel bad for these kids. Sure. Right? And I feel bad for the referees, because they do want to get the call right. They screwed it up. But prolonging this out to four, three, four, five days at this point, whatever it's been, and probably a few more days, is not doing the kids that that ended up getting screwed any good. Yeah, you're teaching it's them a lesson them when, when things don't go your way. You can just try to like, fight it until the end when there's no case for it. It's funny. I'm the type of parent that, like, I, I never found myself bitching and moaning much for my kid. Like, oh, my God, what's that? I was more of a, you know, it's a team thing. Uh, here you go. Like, uh, if I was cheering, I was cheering for everybody on the team. And if my kid made a good play, I would cheer for him or her. Uh, you know, I, I like, watching parents 
scream and holler about their kids and solely involved in just their kid yeah, when they're true. playing a team sport is the biggest turnoff to me in in the world. And I mm -hmm. I, I see it. It's it almost searches my eyes look for it, and I hate that I do it. But I'll see I'll see a reaction in the stands, and I'll be oh who's that? Yeah. Oh that's such and such parents. Really? Well, my do they just care about their kid, or do they care about the team? Yeah, my sister played like D1 field hockey, so all throughout high school and her college games, I would have to sit on the other the other team's sideline because I didn't want to hear other parents, you know, talking about their kid. Like, why? Why should? Why is she not on the field and all oh, that? Like, I have to get away from that. Like, yeah. it's insufferable. And I, and I feel like if you ask the the players that got screwed over in this, they they're at this point probably just want to move on. Like, they're gonna they're obviously they're they're mad you and they're angry so. about it. But they're probably at this point like we're not playing in this game, so can we just? I got trigonometry homework. I well, got, yeah, I got, that's another thing. Yeah, I got I, I got SAT prep. I got to do like I got other things. I'm, you know, I'm 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 ready to go to to Rutgers next year. Like I got other things going on with my life. I play baseball and we have practice next week. Yeah, like you know what I mean. Like they, they probably it might be want... bigger to a lot of other people than it is now. They don't want this. My point is they they probably don't want this story being dragged out the way it is because. They probably want to move on from it. Nobody's more done with it than those Manasquan that's people, right? My, yeah, that's probably, exactly, exactly my point. Exactly. The silver exactly. lining on it is Bob said Manasquan was a huge upset. So what makes me think they were going to go in and win the state championship anyway? Now they have a, a claim that, hey, we could have done it. But in yeah. reality, they might have got blown out tomorrow night. That's a good point. Might have yeah. got, got embarrassed. Brennan Gunn having no faith in Manasquan. You heard it here first. Yeah, so uh, just a shame of it all and, and surprising, like, you know, when you're on Twitter, all the people that are commenting, like I said, even a Dick Vitale, uh, go into it and stuff. Yeah, guess yeah, what? It sucks. Know. It absolutely sucks. I don't mean to get callous uh, with it, but, but like, we just got to move on. No, that's society. okay. I mean, I, look, that's what we do here on the show. People, get, We don't fake it. Like, if you're sick of the story, you're sick of the story. I, I'm a little deeper involved because I know some of the parties and all that stuff, and you know, I, you want to see things done right. Is there going to be change? Like I said, one of my good friends is the head of referees in South Jersey. And he immediately told you, like, there's nothing they can do. No, right? well, it's, it says it in the bylaws. Yeah. There is nothing. Once the referees leave the court, there's nothing that you can do. Maybe the they need to hire over. another law firm. Maybe that's it. Yeah. You know, Michelle Ferrari. Could be. So She's licensed in New Jersey. You, you brought yeah, up. Those rules notarized. You brought up lack of interest, <laughs> Pat. <and, laughs> you brought up lack of interest in that specific topic. I found myself mad at myself again last night. What did you do again? Come so on. I'm switching around the channels. Uh, you know, flyers are between periods, and I'm trying to look for something to three Quidditch to fill the gap. And it's like, um, you know, on the on the guide, you'll see like a ACC tournament or something like yeah, that. And I'm like, yeah. remember in the day that you could name not only when the games were going to be on, but who was playing appointment viewing. And the, oh my God, yep. in college basketball, and like it ruled the day. A10 tournament. We were talking about this God, yesterday. I was like, wait, City. the tournament's already started. Did they really? I, I did like reach out. I saw Penn State up there, and I was like, "Oh, cool. Let me watch them because I know one of their players." I go to that; it's the women's game. I I am so look the local teams. I went and saw play this year, and I'm friends with with some of the coaches. Luckily enough, that that coach Big Five teams here, so my interest there will never change. It's always there. But God, that sport to me has nationally. I don't want to say died, but man, it it's it's, it's in a, a coma to me. To, to me, no, to me as well. I is watch it, every single Villanova game, right? Like I, I've done that since 2007. I watch every single game, but I can't tell you a guy's name on Duke. The first time I learned anybody's name on Duke was two weeks ago when the kid tried to ruin court storming. That's the only reason I know anybody I, on Duke, UNC, Kentucky. I don't know these players anymore. Dude, I know more about Duke's recruiting class than I do the Duke current Duke players. Yeah, I, I don't. I, exactly. And, and I got a text from uh, my buddy Vince. I think last time we were talking about this subject, he goes. I know more women in college basketball than I do men. And I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I probably do too. Like, I, other than the team that I cheer for, which is Temple, when I, when I think about college basketball in this, I don't really know it yeah. all that well. But I probably could name you more women college basketball players than, than the men because I feel like in recent years, the women's game has done a really good job of marketing they're people. And maybe a big reason to that is because their their athletes are staying longer in college. So, like, Bob, you're the first person I heard talk about Caitlin Clark. That was three years ago. And now, if a Caitlin Clark were a guy playing in NCAA, she's playing for one year and then she's going to the pros. Good point. So you're not really able to, to even learn these players because they're not there long enough. 
can't and learn them. You can't develop a love. You can't develop no, a no, hatred like for them. And, there, and there's none of that. And with the transfer portal the way it is, you know, most of the teams like a Temple are revamping their roster every single year. And so I, it's hard to conference get realignment. Yeah. There's no natural rivalries anymore. Like Temple plays the Big Five, and then they play a bunch of. Tulsa. UTSA, like, Tulsa. Yeah, yeah, Port Ray Dunn has to travel down to Texas all the time just to call games because <laughs> well, that's the conference yeah, that they're the, in. Yeah, the American Athletic Conference is based in Dallas, and yeah. you can tell because all their teams are in Dallas except, you know, a few, and one of them's Temple. You know, I'm sure Temple would love to get to a Big Five conference, but they don't win enough to do it. Yeah, so they'd have to rely on their media market. It's the transfer portal. Even watching a Nova for me, I can't fall in love with these guys. These are guys that are here on a one-year NLI transfer thing for graduates. Yeah. Like, and that's, I still root for the team, but I don't have the same connection that I did to guys that stayed for four years. That, not at all. Yeah, the Nova teams that won, the legendary Nova teams, you were able to connect with them so much because you had a Mikhail Bridges who would come in in red shirt. Sophomore year, he gets a little bit of run. And then junior year, you know, he breaks out. And I like, watched them go from nobody to an NBA yeah, player. Yeah, exactly. You, you had guys that developed under Jay Wright, but at least, like, you could see flashes in year, you know, from year one to year two to year three to them developing. Now it's like, oh, I'm not getting time. I'm, I'm transferring out. I mean, it's so rare that, you know, it just seems like you, you get a superstar that will stay there for four years and develop under a coach because it's uh, the immediate gratification of I need to play, I need to play, I need to play. Yeah, I and to me, part of it, when I was thinking about this subject last night, you know, with you celebrating your birthday, I say, Pat, and I'm, I'm being honest on this, like you said something like, yeah, now that I'm getting to this age, you wonder about, and, you know, whatever story you were telling. I'm at the age, like, obviously I want to hold on to my youth. You know, I, I, I still feel like I'm 20 years old. All of that, I and you guys will test I acted. But I, I'm, I feel like I'm use, losing something from my youth. I feel like that Thursday and Friday for the first two weeks when you have games at noon has been taken away from me. And it's nobody's doing but mine because I could show or keep up the interest. But they've made it awfully hard. Yeah. And, and, and college basketball, it's, it's such a shame. And like I said, the locals will always be there. Pat and I, uh, we'll all go to, to Temple games, LaSalle games, Villanova games. All of that because we have local interests, we have friends, we have family, all of that. But, man, on the national level, I hate the hit that I, I'm just talking yeah. personally, that I've taken on this, that something was taken away from my youth. Man, I remember growing up and hating, hating Duke players. And I'm not talking like the team. I couldn't stand Coach K. Shane Battier, I loathed. J.J. Redick. Like, you grow up and, like, learn these guys because they were all over Sports Center. Sure. You know, and you would know, like, the top the top players in the country because they were appointment viewing. I mean, it, we have the game in, in our in Brandon Gunn's studio where we have a big whiteboard and someone will put a name up and you have to follow with another name that it's either their first and last name. You put up Hollis Price a couple, a couple weeks ago, and I was like, dude, I loved watching him at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Like, he was incredible at Oklahoma. I, I couldn't tell you one player in college, let alone, like, a player from Oklahoma. Yeah, I, 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 I've because told this story before. NCAA did such a good job of promoting those guys, and now it's like they don't really care. Eight or nine years ago, uh, you know, one of my last couple years at the Daily News, we did it every year. Me, Dick Girardi, and, and the late John Smallwood, we, they would tell us, all right, guys, need your top uh, 30 picks before the NBA draft. Each team need their first-round draft pick. Go ahead. And Girardi and I would sit across from each other, pen and paper, with nothing else. And write out who we thought was going to be the top 30 picks. We weren't looking at, oh, we, we didn't have to look guys up. No, because you just knew. You know, you just knew them. And now, and no. If, I, if I were to ask you who's the top pick in the NBA, like, I, it, it's hard I, to say. I, I, I know would, the kid, yeah. Yeah, who, who's the top five for the Wooden Award right now? It, it's no just, idea. It's, I would guess it's, I mean, when you say top pick, I would guess it's a kid in the G League. Because that's the problem, too, is a lot of kids that are at that level of, Holy crap! Like this is this is must view TV. Have now been like, no, I'm gonna go to the G League. I'm gonna get a pro experience. I'm gonna get 100K. And yeah, it's gonna suck because I'm gonna be playing like Fort Wayne, Indiana. But like, I'd rather do that than go to college. A lot of them are doing are going that route instead of doing you know the traditional. I'm gonna go to college for, for a couple of years, and that's that day is done. And that's I, probably why yeah, you know more female uh, college basketball players and you do men you I, made the great point because i never thought of it i was like yeah why do we i'm not saying it's a good thing bad thing whatever but it's because they stay there four years yeah. like the, and they develop stars that way and, and it's going to go down as the last 
school to do that the right way was Villanova. Yeah. It's going yeah. to go down as that. The last team that you could embrace that you knew because they were there because Jay Wright's plan, which changed while he was there, was to get guys that weren't NBA players then when they came in but had the potential to become Gillespie. that. Like Gillespie yeah. might be the last of that guy ever sure. who, who developed uh, from a red shirt all the way to an NBA player right now. He's on the Nuggets. Like, you won a ring last year. Like, yeah. it, it, you don't see that anymore. It sucks that we're about to be in tournament time. The bracket's going to come out, and I am going to be completely 100% guessing when I fill it out, which means I have a shot of winning, by the way. <laughs> you have but a I'm going to be guessing because, I mean, in previous years, I'd at least have a clue of, like, hey, I really like this team. I've watched this team a little bit. I think this team could go. I, have, I don't have a damn clue. Temple's my, not going to be in my it. favorite two days of the year. Oh, we used to be that Thursday, Friday. Yeah. I'm still clinging on to it. But, like, I used to, my mom used to let me, if I was doing good in school, I got to leave early the Thursday, the opening Thursday, and go home and watch it. Yeah. Back before all the games were on TV, you could How only watch you? one. What, when they switched to every no, game? No, on? I'm saying when, when your mom was like, F school, he's going to watch. 16 or so. He was oh, okay. cool. All right. Yeah. No, cool. like that, that's, cool. no, that's cool. Yeah, like I, high school. When I was at the Daily News, up. we had a, uh, this is like, God, it's 20 years ago, more. Uh, we had a huge bracket, so much so that the beat writers, the Phil Jasners and all, would take them down to the Sixers and all, and they would fill them out, and they would be in our thing. We had, you know, 3,000, 2,500 people in these things. So this one year, I would fill one out. My dad would fill one out also. So hand them in this one year. Uh, my dad hands his bracket, and I take it in for him. I think he was, he was retired at the time. Uh, hands in. My dad dies in the middle of the tournament, right? So it kind of took away from the oh, tournament yeah, this, a little this bit. This became no, a little no, 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 buzzkill no. of a story uh, there, so, Bobby. championships played, you know, whatever, going to work the next day. Guy comes with an envelope of, like, $1,500. I'm like, what's this? He goes, your dad came in third place. No way. Yeah. So I dispersed it. I was honest. I dispersed it among the four kids that um, we had. So, That's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I, that was like my dad's going out. Like, That's awesome. <laughs> Got you. Give you a fifteen hundred dollar settlement check. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that was ball. pretty cool. Hey, listen, it's a fanatic Friday, and you know what that means. It's presented by Pump Man Philly. Hold on, don't do it. MBG, what are we doing, Pump Man Philly? Wow, weak. You know what? Yeah, she really yeah. has mailed it in. She has mailed it. My God, we knew you were going to work. We thought you were going to work. She's here day. in body alone, in oh spirit. She is gone. For twenty four seven emergency repair or pump replacement, count on Pump Man Philly. The guys to know to fix your flow. Okay, when we get back here on the John Kincaid Show, Brendan and I have a problem with a couple of Sixers. He has one quote that upset him. I have another quote that upset me. And we're going to hit on Pat for another for uh, a little bit of Jason Kelsey talk because I think this fan base is going to miss him, and Pat wants to dive into it a little bit more. This is the John Kincaid Show here on 97.5 The Fanatic.
Cody, on the topic of moving on from the Camden Manasquan game, there's a video the Manasquan team posted on social me media basically saying we appreciate the support, but we ask that everyone shift their attention towards supporting the girls team who's playing in the Group 2 state final at Rutgers on Saturday. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. So there it is. You know, when you look at, at times of things are bad, things are bad, and you look for the bad, good comes out of it. Manasquan, good on you, as Brett Brown would say. Like, that's cool. Good Sounds job like the, by them. The kids have a more level head on their shoulders than some of the uh, superintendents I, 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 trying it, it, to sue the state. And that's the thing. That's my, that's my problem with it. It's the superintendents, the parents, the alumni. That's who's upset. Like, the yeah. kids are obviously upset, but they've probably moved on to AP Calc. Yeah, and, or, or baseball practice, or, like, you know, their girlfriend they can spend more time with. Yeah, I think yeah, kids are more resilient than we than we give them credit for. You didn't have to be weird, but well, I didn't. I, I don't. Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, uh -huh. me, me being weird. All right, so there's a I'm lot of hand. <laughs> that's true. Good point. No, you've been very sentimental this week. MBG and I were just talking about that. Like Pat, uh, uh, I don't know. No. Twice no. on the air this week, he's no. like giving me compliments about, oh, he's that guy, and then I didn't tell you to Twitter. And then he sent an email to me yeah. and MBG yesterday saying, thank you so much. You made my birthday what it all was. Right. Enough. And enough. I have a I bad mean... boy image to keep. All right? <laughs> yeah, good point. I turn right when it says no turn on, on Pat's red. Pat's heart grew three sizes yesterday. Relax, everybody. All right? <laughs> so one of the things I started the show with when talking about the 76ers was the two headlines uh, on, on consecutive pages in the Daily News today. Season slipping through their fingers was one headline. And another one was just down and depleted. And it's talking about the 76ers. And, and Brendan, you had a, a quote that you saw this week that didn't really sit well with you. Yeah, not at all. Kelly Oubre came out after the game, and he said something that just had me scratching my head. Like, how is this team that's on the verge of being a playoff team without Joel Embiid, maybe not even that for a full season, and they're going to come out and play what Kelly Oubre described them as? And I'll let the, the people hear it yeah. and, and see if they feel the same way I do. I'm going to just say this, like, I think we can learn a lot from tonight because we all knew that Memphis is missing a lot of guys, and so are we. And, uh, you know, it was a real, like, testament of, like, hard work beats talent when talent don't work hard. Right. So uh, I just think that that was the whole gist of the game tonight. So you mean to tell me you're without Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, and Kyle Lowry? And you're going to go out there and act like you're the better team, you're the more talented team, and try to just just show up and you're going to beat the Memphis Grizzlies? No. You guys have won, like, what, five games out of the last 25 games, it feels like? Without Joel Embiid, and especially Tyrese Max and Kyle Lowry on top of that, you have to be the one that, that outworks everybody. You have to go out there and be the role players that you are, but now you have to become stars. You can't go out there and just score eight points like a Tobias Harris. Kelly Oubre, the funniest part is he's the one saying it, but he's the only one that showed up in my mind that night. Uh, it's easier to say it when you have 30-point, 25-point games behind you, I guess, right? Yeah, uh, that's a great point, but like you, these guys need to show up. You can't just show up on the court and expect to out-talent out people. It's beyond that point. Maybe when you were without Embiid in the beginning and you thought yeah, you guys were bigger parts to that than you absolutely were, but... Now, how can you say that? And how he believes his teammates are just showing up? Come on. Like, yeah. That's very frustrating to hear, even if it's true. Do you guys remember a couple of weeks ago when uh, we were talking about the Sixers going into a pretty tough part of their schedule? And we were talking about, yeah, Embiid's out, so you can't really expect the type of play that you want. But my point was things are going to grow. Like, problems are going to grow. Do you remember me saying this like, a couple weeks ago, yeah. Pat? Like, it, it's going to... As much as we should say, yeah, but they don't have him, it doesn't matter. Problems are going to grow. The Tobias Harris thing is going to grow. And all of these things. Well, it's starting to get there. Because then the, the quote that got me after that game against Memphis the other night was from Tobias Harris. And his was, we come out here. We don't have Kyle. We don't have Tyrese. Now we're scrambling. Half the time, we don't even know what we're in on offense. So that's tough as well on just organization. I mean, that hurt us tonight as well. It, it's, it's, that's not a knock on Nick Nurse. It's not a knock on when he says we don't even know what we're in on offense. You don't even know who's out there. Like, he's looking up and he's getting a pass from, I don't know, Ricky Council, the fourth, and he's probably saying, like, I have no idea what this, who's the kid that came in, Jeff Pouton, the other night? Jeff Downton. Downton, yeah. Downton. Yeah. I mean, like, you're going to tell me a Tobias Harris uh, uh, has in the back of his mind? Oh, yeah, I know Dalton when he throws me this pass. He likes to, to fake one way and then cut through a lane, so I'll look for that bounce pass.
these guys don't know who the hell's out there. So it's it's just a really bad, bad time. And this Tyrese Maxey concussion, while it would never help you, it couldn't have come at a worse time either. Really couldn't have, yeah, because you're it came at a time where you had winnable games on the schedule. And you looked at March and you went, all right, 17 games in March, a lot of tough opponents on there. You got you can't count on Joel Embiid being back for any of them. I, I see like seven wins on that, and I'll be I'll be happy with six seven wins. And they start off March two and zero, oh, and you're like, okay, we're on the right we're on the right road. And then all of a sudden, without Tyrese Maxey, it is it's tough sledding. Like you're 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 going uphill. It it is t- tough. Like it, you can't go out there. You're missing half the starters. But I go back to that Ubre quote. Like you, just because you don't have your starters and it's hard to play with guys that you have never played before. If you're not showing the effort out there to a team that is 12 games back of just the playing tournament, the Memphis Grizzlies, they're 12 games out. They're a month away. You don't think their minds are in some other places where they're just like, ah, I can't wait for the offseason? And the Sixers in the middle of a playoff hunt trying to remain in the top six so you don't get a playing, playing game tournament and you're not giving more effort than them? That's what I have a problem with. Uh, some will dive deeper and say, well, there's a reason Kelly Oubre goes all around the league because he says stuff like this after he scored 25 and 30 points, and now he can point fingers elsewhere. Like, you can't have that. Everything is going to be uh, exploited. Everything is going to show bigger in a bad way when things are going like this. And uh, like we talked about, when Tobias Harris has eight-point games when you need him for 20, 25 a night, that can't happen. You know, Kyle Lowry's not going to be able to play back-to-back, especially now that you're playing him 34 minutes a game. That's not going to happen. Nick Batum's 35, 36 years old. He's not going to be able to give you all these minutes down the stretch, and, you know, you're probably going to have to save him with the hope of when Joel Embiid gets back, he means more to the team because, you know, he fits better when Joel Embiid's on the court. There's just so much of this. Where's Buddy Heald gone? You know, he had four games of 20 points and more his first four games here. Hasn't scored over 15 cents. You know, so these problems are just getting bigger and bigger. They have New Orleans in tonight, a good team. I, that's going to be a struggle to win that game. I don't know where this team is right now, and I know why I don't know why where this team is now. This is reminding me of the 6-7 and seven finish for the Eagles. Like, it's just heading in a direction where I don't think there's a, a, a solve to the problem. Like, unless Embiid comes back and is fully healthy, I don't expect any of that. They're heading in a direction where I, I just feel like there's no hope this season at this point. Like, I, I really don't think I, there's hope for anything. I Man, I felt like that when Joel Embiid went, went out with that injury. Like, yeah, but I, was, I, I was at that point. I, I didn't want to be sucked into believing in, in false idols at that point. And these, the ideas that, oh, well, if he comes back and if this breaks the right way. Because the reality is it never breaks the right way for this team. You're and right. I, don't mean, I don't mean to be like sky is falling guy, like, oh, what was me? And it... You know, oh, why can't we have nice things? But, like, why can't we have nice things? But it's well, easy to convince yourself when you look at the East and who else outside of Boston, when when you think about a healthy Sixers, I think they match up good with you're, everybody okay, else. You're right. It is easy to convince yourself, but you said the key word there is healthy. And as soon as he went down, they weren't healthy. And I, I just kept going back to, if if you're a Sixers fan and you take Tatum off of Boston, what 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 are you thinking about Boston's chances? They're done. All right, so if you take Giannis off of the Bucks, what do you think about the Bucks' chances? They're, They're done. done, but I don't Brunson think Boston's of, going out sorry like, like we're going so, out sorry. I, uh, Boston, no, because they're pretty deep, and they have better. I mean, the reality is The discussions is like, we had before but, Embiid went down was this is the deepest team we've ever seen the Sixers have in the Embiid era, and now, now it doesn't look like that at all. Look, it was deep, but they also, they didn't, you know, the trade deadline happens. And you get rid of some of that depth to get in a buddy healed, so that affects it. Um, they were deep, but they also relied way too heavily on their their star. And then you're putting it all on Tyrese Maxey. And even though to, you'd like Tobias Harris to step up from being a, a third option to a two option, he found a way to be a fourth option. I don't know how, but he went backwards. So to your point that, yeah, Boston wouldn't go out this far, you're right because they have different players that, like, will step up. And I don't get the sense that the Sixers have that when you have, uh, you know, Tobias Harris, you finds ways to just ne- never be able to really step. I mean, we had a two-game stretch of Tobias Harris looking like a somewhat max player. And it was, oh, is he unlocked? Like, is it? are we good? Is this Tobias Harris? Is he here to stay? And it's like, that that we got excited over two games. 
Yeah, well, I'm starting to lean towards you when you think when you always say the windows closed for this. Uh, that's the way I'm leaning. Like, can't, that brings me no joy, by the way. I, 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 me, I, I don't no. want to say that either. But like, you look at the the way they built this roster, and you thought it was great. They they got all the perfect role players around Embiid. Well, if Embiid's going to go down, and he goes down every year, and those perfect role players now become suspect when he's not there, and, and you're borderline not a playing team, then how are you going to build this roster after that? Because you'd, you're going to have to get more stars on the team like a Boston just in case Embiid goes down so you can stay afloat when he's gone. But in a perfect world, the role-player way seemed like it was working. You had the best 30-game start since 2001. Right? Yeah, and, and, the, and the people you're relying on after if a Joel Embiid comes back also has to be of some concern because Nick Batum is 35 years old yeah. and he's been injured a lot this year. Yeah. If Covington comes back and you're counting on him as a specialist, 33 years old, has been bothered by injury over the last few years. Tobias Harris is 31, but that guy will go out there and play all the time. But he healed 31. Kyle Lowry, as we know, 37. Like, the guys that you're going to be relying on, you know, you can't either because health has to come into play with those guys a little bit also. Yeah, I mean, look, all those guys that we mentioned as, as good role player, good depth guys, they look a lot better when Joel Embiid's out there. So you you start kind of believing that they might be better than they are, and you take Joel Embiid out, and it's like, I, we've all played sports, and you all know who the best player on, on, the, on the field, court, ice, whatever it is, that you know who it is. You know who the guy is that you want to get the ball to, the puck to, the, whatever, the guy you're relying on. And you know that if that guy doesn't show up because he's got a doctor's appointment or something, you're like, crap, all right, looking around, who's going to step up? We're all, we're all decent players, but none of us are take over a game player. Joel Embiid's a take over a game player. Tyrese Maxey can be that. You take those two guys off the team because of an injury, I don't know who takes over. Buddy Heald can't create his own shot. Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, Kelly Oubre is, is nice off the bench. Um, he, he, I mean, but, like, other than that, you know, I'm not going to get on the Tobias Harris thing. I ran again, but, like, they're starting Cam friggin' Payne. Cam Payne, they're starting. I, I can't expect this team to do much when we're forced to start campaign. How do you build the roster, Kyle Lowry? Like, how do you build the roster? Well, like, the, the roster is good if you have Joel Embiid. But you can't count on that anymore. You, you, can't, you Unfortunately, can't. you can't. But I, I also can't blame Daryl Morey for building a roster around him because... Yeah, fool me once th this time because it looked great with, the, with all the role players around him. It yeah. looked like the best Sixers team in this era. But I can't get fooled again yeah, by this I, next year and then try to the same thing, getting the perfect role players around and beat, and then he misses a month again. Look, Roger Dolce, you can't get fooled again, but I can. <laughs> and I also can't blame I, – I, I can't blame Daryl Morey for building a roster around Joel Embiid because every year, while it pains me, I fall into the trap of, he can't get injured again, right? Because it's just every year. I'm like, there won't be a fluke injury again for the for the umpteenth time in his career, right? There won't be some phantom elbow. There won't be a broken finger, a ligament in this knee, that knee, thumbs, hands. It, it, I mean, eventually he's going to be healthy for at least one season, right? So if I'm going in with that mindset, I also can't blame Daryl Morey for going in with that mindset. I want him to have that mindset. And then, of course, when the injury does happen, you go, how foolish of me. I was young and naive. I was stupid. How did I not see it coming? So it's 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 a crappy situation that we find ourselves in as Sixers fans because I do think that the window's pretty much closed and it sucks and I don't find any joy in that because yeah you get the healthy MB that's a stone that can smash that window yeah but, but when he's not healthy to expect this team to do much is I think foolish because taking the the hundred foot view of the NBA you take LeBron off the Lakers they still have AD but they're not doing anything okay. You take KD off the Suns, they still have Devin Booker. They're not doing anything. You take one of the best players, if not the best player, off of his team to expect them to all of a sudden ascend. It's and you know, campaign is supposed to step in and you know, you know, Paul Reed and Mo Bamba are supposed to fill that role. It's it's really tough. They can do it every once in a while. You'll see it like once a week, where it's like, oh, we had a nice performance here. But to ask those guys to do something they're they're legitimately not capable of. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I just didn't think it would get this bad. And, no, it, and it, I, the one I thing it. I will fault Maury on is, you know Embiid's going to miss some time at some point, and you, your best option is Mo Bamba and Paul Reed? See, I, 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 once again, I can't blame him for that either. Because Paul Reed, at least, I, I like the Paul Reed contract. Because as a fan, I'm going, okay, that's a guy that you can develop. You have been trying to develop. He's shown you spurts, but it was under Doc Rivers, who would play him 
basically when he had to and never before. Now you have Nick Nurse coming in whose bread and butter is developing. Like, he's able to take these guys and mold them into something. I can't blame him for Daryl Morey for going like, all right, maybe we can get a young backup who can play the four and the five. It hasn't worked out. And that's why I go, if there is one blessing in the disguise of, of maybe them either missing the playoffs or losing, it's, all right, like, maybe you get out of that contract. Because paying Paul Reed $7 million and $8 million, it ain't it. Like, $15 million over the next two years. He's not a $15 million player. It's the worst thing in sports when, when a guy that you have deemed a 8 to 12 minute a night guy has to be a 25 to 30 minute night guy. Yeah. Right? And not... that's what Paul Reed is. And, and, then and they... he shows you stretches. Yeah. He, yeah. He shows you stretches. And I, I said last year, like, well, try him as the backup four. Maybe even throw him in the starting lineup as a four yep. uh, if you're committed to him. Um, he's not a center in this league. No, and he was, we all know that. He was good last game. Like, I don't want to take that away from him. He was yeah, good. Yeah, he was good last game. Yeah, double, he, he double, gave fouled Jokic out. 30 points a month ago. Like, he has his spurts, but... But they're too, he, they're too inconsistent. They're too few and far between. He's a 12-minute guy, like Bob said, man. Like, he, he's a third option at the center position at the very... At, at the, in the worst case, and a second in the, at the four. Like, yeah, the, it's... Um, I, we're, we're asking these guys to do something they're just simply not capable of. And what makes it frustrating is you, you said, you know, I didn't expect it to be this bad. It looks this bad because of the last two games they've played. Whereas if they end up pulling those games out, you're looking at a March where they've been 4-0, and and it, we're singing a different tune. But you blow those games, and that's exactly what they did. They blew them. I mean, you're up double digits, and you lose the game. Uh, and now we're sitting here going, I didn't expect it to be this bad. 6-14 and 14 over their last 20. Uh, the Joel Embiid, Sean Comp, uh, brought up a good thought on our YouTube page. Um, where where's the four week update with Joel Embiid? Now it's not a secret. We asked Kate Scott yesterday. Hey, have you heard anything? Do you know when they're going to announce it? She doesn't know. Uh, we had heard last week that they were gonna. There was going to be an update. There was supposed to be an update early this week. That came and went. Uh, the one month mark. Joel Embiid went out January thirtieth. Was the game the last game he played against Golden State? Uh, with surgery the next week. Uh, that. Four month or four week now it's five week has come and gone. Like maybe I'm being what? cynical. If they announce he's gone, are are, are people checked out? Like uh, if I, I, I'd sure, argue, that's got to be the business thought. I'd argue that we're already pretty checked out, and I'd argue that uh, we're checked out, and the only thing we're waiting for isn't game day. It's it's an update. Well, jo it's, it's, here's a perfect one, Pat. Uh, Josh, who works with us, young kid, he's probably like what, 15, 16? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Daniel Rack, uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a strange dude. Uh, but anyway. Good like, friends with Abe Lincoln. He's like, uh, yeah, one tickets to the Sixers oh. game. Bob, are you going on, on Friday night? And I, he's like, I get to go see Kelly Oubre play. And here's a young kid that probably hasn't been to a lot of Sixers game, and he's making fun of the fact that he's going down to watch Kelly Oubre play. Yeah. That like, sucks. that's so the interest that you're talking about that has been waning. Yes, I don't understand. I don't want to say I don't understand. I, I, If we are promised an update, why aren't we getting it? We, we watch the games uh, because it's our job. Like, we have to pay attention. That's part of the gig, right? It's, oh, my God. Poor, and, and we like poor, watching basketball no, and sports. Don't and be ridiculous. That. Don't, no, stop. Don't be ridiculous. Like, poor Brandon Gunn. He's got to watch basketball for a living. But I, don't, I also don't blame any Sixers <laughs> fan who goes, yeah, I ain't watching this. Like, seeing, start, seeing some of these starting lineups... I wouldn't blame any Sixers fan for going. There's a lot of good stuff on Netflix. Uh, I, yeah. think I'll, I think I'll check out. Because the the update that you talk about, Bob, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm not waiting for tonight's matchup, sadly. Because I'm expecting tonight's matchup to be a loss. And I'll pay attention to it. And I'll, I'll kind of hate watch it. And I'll get all angry if they blow a double-digit lead again. But I'm waiting for an update. And as someone who did the beat as long as you did and made connections and all that, would you say the fact that we've got a lack of an update and it's Friday at this point, is that a good sign or is it a bad sign? Because I'm leaning towards, are we, in, are we setting ourselves up for a Friday news dump? It's a, it's a frustrating uh, feeling that I have. Like, I, I, I've said this a lot in, in the past and, and still now. Injuries aren't your fault as an organization. Guys get injured. And it's a shame Joel Embiid has gotten these injuries and all. But there's nothing wrong with being open and honest about them. And I, uh, there has to be a business aspect to it, uh, a reason why from on up high uh, that, that it's probably told, no, nah, let's not give updates. You, you can't tell me you don't have an update. You can give me an update every day. Yeah. Um, so 
I, I don't know. I, I, I can't say it's good news or unless they want to just spring good news on you and say, yeah, sorry we didn't report last week, but Joe's been playing all this week. He's going to come back on Tuesday. So that's that's why I'm kind of leaning towards, like, every day that goes by, he's closer to a return. So that's kind of a positive. We don't – I'd rather – I'd rather get a hard update than what, what we think we're going to get. Rather which is, what? We had a break anyway. No, I didn't hear what you said. I you, heard, you heard what I said. You'd rather get and, an and, – and, and, and it was a faux pas on my part. It was – but we talked for four hours, and sometimes you're going to say some stuff that when you clip it out of context, it's going to sound bad. That was one of those moments. I got some I, allegations I, surrounding Temple basketball. I want to talk to I, Pat. I, 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 did, <laughs> to I, did, I did. I did see these. Yeah. 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 Uh, you can talk about it on the break because I'm not filled in on it. I don't like going at something with ignorance, so I'm I, not going to uh, get into that. Maybe we'll do that on Monday uh, once we we can find some more things out about. Stuff. But okay, but to, real quick to wrap, to put a bow on this Joel Embiid stuff. And maybe it's not a bad thing because maybe we're just. We're, we're preconditioned at this exactly. point as Sixers fans. Good point. To one, be negative when anything happens with Joel Embiid, basically. With injury. With injury. But two, we're also preconditioned, and we have talked about it because we live this, this life of the Sixers medical update that is not really an update. It's an update to an update. Oh, yeah, he continues to work towards a uh, return, and he'll re- be reevaluated in two weeks. What if they just scrap that entirely, and then when, when we finally do get an update, it's an actual update? Because I wouldn't have a problem with that, and I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around that idea that maybe they're just kind of done with doing updates towards an update. And, and maybe it's like, hey, we told you the timeline. We told you it was going to be two months. It hasn't been two months. So when he's gearing up, we'll give you an actual update instead of going, hey, by the way, guys, uh, no real news. Uh, we'll let you know. Yeah. Uh, we kinda just don't have, know. I'd kind of rather have that than what I'm expected to get, which is the update towards the update. Yeah, so we'll see how it all plays back, plays out. But um, I don't know. The longer it goes, I still have belief. I'm not going to say hope. I still have belief that he's going to be on the floor this season. Don't know why. That's just how you can't help how you feel. Yeah, I want to see him. Oh, with, everybody wants like, to see you, him, you yeah. Wa- you want to see him with the guys we got because it's going to be a big off season. Like, this is the going to be the defining off season for Daryl Morey's career in Philadelphia. Like, so he has to go out there and solidify this team because we're in the final stretch of Joel Embiid's window. What, there's two years left, three years left? And this Get is the most Get everything out of him you can. Yeah. Yeah, why well. not? Yeah, Fanatic Friday. It's presented by Pump Man Philly. For 24-7 emergency repair or pump replacement, count on Pump Man Philly, the guys to know to fix your flow. When we get back, a little bit of a recap on what went on around the city and nationally yesterday. We're going to dive into some more Sixers, and we do have some more Phillies prediction questions that I want to ask the boys. We did some yesterday. We'll recap them, and we'll go dive into some more of those. When we get back here on the John Kincaid Show here at 97.5, the Fanatic. Update. One more year. I'm Brendan Gunn, and this update is brought to you by the Bet Parks app. When you open up the
uh, that we talked about, yes or no, that we w if we wanted them here or not, in Xavier McKinney, Eddie Jackson, Justin Sims, CJ GJ, you know, a lot of thoughts on those things. Free agency for the NFL is on Wednesday, so a lot will go on until then. And your Phillies today on TV at 1 o'clock, so put it on, turn the sound down, keep Andrew Salchunas on, and watch Ranger Suarez go against the Houston Astros today. Yeah, Nola looked good yesterday. Five strikeouts and three. Had a long, yeah, three innings, gave up yeah. some runs and hits and strikeouts. So stretch the arm out a little bit, right? That's what you like to see this time of year. You're ramping up. We're within three weeks of opening day now. It's the home stretch. It certainly is. So uh, it is getting close, Pat. Right. I know you're not looking yet, but pretty soon you're going to start looking and saying, Oh, look at that. Trey no, Turner's you know, sitting 485. You know, There's a I game in like a week and a half that uh, that counts in uh, Korea. Like, oh, is that right? Yeah, uh, the Dodgers are playing somebody out there, and it's a real game, a like uh, regular season game. The, the moment that I start getting, like, in the mode of baseball season is, uh, I, may, I mean, it's, it's such nerd crap, but it's my fantasy baseball draft. It's like my big league it's that I nerd do. nerd at all. When I, when, I, when I do that league, it's like, all right, now I'm – now I'm like ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to. to and this is with the last. people you hate. Oh, well, I almost. I, I did almost curse. I loathe That's these fair. people. I cannot stand them. Really? Can't stand. I there's there's I, like. I hope they're not listeners. They're, they're not. There's three guys in the league that I like. Uh, one's my best friend. The other's my uncle. And the rest of them can absolutely kick rocks. They're fifty year old whiny men who will sit there and complain about everything. Oh, it's not fair. The trade wasn't fair. So they're just the way I. I I show up at these drafts like Arya Stark. I have, like, a hit list, and I want to take all of them out. Green eyes, blue eyes. Yeah, all of them, man. I mean, I just see faces, and uh, and I just want to, like, ruin their day. Uh, I remember the one time this guy was – was because it was, it's an auction league, and he was bidding on someone. I didn't even know who the guy was, and I just kept bidding him up just to stick it to him. And he knew I didn't know who it was, but he really wanted him, and he was letting his emotions, like, show that he wanted this guy. I had, it was uh it was actually the guy played for the Phillies was like Oscar something. There we go. That's game, Oscar that's Oscar Mercado. Eight it was today. Oscar Mercado when he was like a Triple A player with the Indians, and he wanted him so bad. I didn't know who he was, but I was bidding this guy up because he's a he's a Mets fan. BG, he's a Mets fan, so I don't like him that at front. No, you got to get rid of him. And uh, he's got a punchable face. So yeah, I don't like any of these guys. It used to be my favorite day of the year, the baseball draft, because same thing. We had a bidding draft, and it was fifty cent increments, yeah, and you had a hundred dollars. Yeah, we have hundred bucks. Believe we only do National League, or did we do both leagues? I don't remember. See, we do but American one of the League guys, and a couple National League teams. One of the guys that, that used to be in our league would come with a huge box every year. Boom. And you put it down, you know, like, hey, dollar Randy Johnson, dollar fifty two, twelve dollars $12 Randy Johnson. You got him. And as soon as you got the guy, a baseball card would come flying at you, Randy Johnson. But that's every cool. player that was bid on uh, and that's got actually, that's pretty he cool. had the baseball card and got him out for <laughs> you. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah ours, we, ours is, oh, it was so much fun. It's too long, and then, you know. It is a long time. It's, it's, it is long, but it is fun. I get way too into it, and I am, I am horrible at it. Uh, it horrible. I still remember coming home, like, first being married. And, you know, saying that, you know, today's our baseball draft. It was always on a Friday. This is at Joey Merton's house. So you go over there and you bring your own cooler, you know, and you sit there, maybe some snacks uh -huh. or we order pizza. Yep. And you're there for like four hours. And it's, all right, break time. Take a break, whatever. Yep. And then yep. next team out, New York Mets. And you'd be like, oh, and you're trying to figure things out. An auction bet is so cool because it's it not just players. You're figuring out your money the oh, whole absolutely. time. And yeah, so here, here's, how, here's how much I don't really, like, gel with these guys at all. You, you guys have worked me long enough. Like, I, I consider myself a fun guy. Yeah. All right? Like, I'm not trying to be Kawhi You're Leonard. You're a mushroom. I'm not trying to be Kawhi Leonard right now. Fun guy. I, I am so, like, and you guys also know that when I don't like somebody, it's pretty obvious. Like, I just, I Yeah, you can down. tell right away. Yeah. The one guy last year was like, oh, yeah, well, Pat's always miserable. And I got, oh. I got back on, and I was like, no, buddy, it's just I don't like you guys. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, you don't know me. All right? We get together once a year. To talk about what, how much Mike Trout's going to go for. You don't know me. You don't know my life. I'm fun. I'm the <laughs> definition of fun. You can't spell party without Pat. Blast to the Ends glass. Ends up being R-Y. So don't talk about me. <laughs> Petro. Call him out on his name. <laughs> Joe Petro. Wow, I hope Joe Petro's not listening. Oh, I can't stand that dude in the draft. Mets fan? He's not a Mets fan. He's the guy in the draft that because it's an auction and because the money matters, he just won't bid. He won't bid on anybody. And you're like, would you spend your damn money? Because there's people I want, but I'm worried you want them. So you just saved all his money so for the good would, players? He, dude, it's like he rolls over like $5 every year. It's just so frustrating. 
Yeah, he's a Yankees fan. I don't like him either. A lot, of, see, a, lot of Yankees, a lot of Yankees and Mets fans in this league. I don't like any of them. I wouldn't either. Thank so, you for letting me vent. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. I feel, I feel better. Uh, you look so anyway, good, that's too. in two weeks. Sounds like fun. <laughs> No wonder Pat doesn't look forward to opening day. I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, op- opening day, on. opening day is when the season ends for me. <laughs> There's that two week gap where I think I have a chance, then opening day happens, and it's, I become, I become the New York Mets. I become what I hate. <laughs> Season's over. It's done. So we were talking Sixers having lost 14 of their last 20 games. I was just looking over their schedule here, and we hit on it a little bit before, but now it kind of smacks you in the face when, while Pat was going on his little dissertation there, I looked up the line tonight. No regrets. No, you shouldn't. Sixers are nine-point underdogs tonight at home against New Orleans. Because it doesn't no, surprise me. No, but it's but it's a slap. It's that's no, a, slap a huge line. It's just I a oh my god, is. that's where they are. Yeah, I think I I think that's what it is. But it's not the sad part to me. Isn't the line? The sad part to me is I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, I'm not necessarily surprised either. But it's so crazy to think about when I go down the the, the bets on, on my app of choice and I see a nine-point favorite. I'm like that. That game's over before it even starts. Is that really where we are right now? I know it's it does suck. Uh, but looking at their schedule moving forward, so you have tonight against New Orleans, Sunday at New York Knicks, Tuesday at New York Knicks, Thursday at Milwaukee. Then you come home for a Saturday game against Charlotte, uh, Monday at home against Miami. Then you got the West Coast trip at Phoenix, at Lakers, at Clippers, at Kings. At Clippers again. Or no, then you come, I'm sorry, then you come home for the Clippers. But you're coming home and playing, you play, your last West Coast game is Monday in Sacramento. You're playing the Clippers at home on a Wednesday. That's hard. I, I've told you guys before, that's bad. And then you go on the road for two more games. That, it, that, that Clippers game could be day knockout. It's going to be a lot of fun. I don't have the copy for it, so I'm going to have to get well, that. Well, it's, uh, it's going to be the Clippers game, and we're going to be giving Clippers out game on and... March 27th. Yeah, what we're going to do on Monday, this coming Monday, yep. you have a chance to win tickets to go and see the Sixers play the Clippers, mm-hmm. and then after the game, go down on the floor and play knockout with your favorite or least favorite hosts here at the Fanatic. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, it's going to be a great time. I'll do the official read later because there's a it, there's a sponsorship thing involved, uh, but I didn't see it today. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. But man, that's a daunting schedule out in front of them. And any schedule is going to be daunting when you're as uh, deple- when your roster is as depleted as the Sixers is. The hope is Tyrese Maxey comes back on a Sunday, maybe Tuesday. Uh, you do want to be careful, you know, with a head injury like that. So we'll see. Uh, this is the John Kincaid Show here at 97.5 The Fanatic. When we get back, we're going to do some more predictions on your Philadelphia Phillies. We did some yesterday. We'll recap them. But as the season gets closer, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. John Kincaid Show here at 97.5 The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. One more year. I'm Brendan Gunn, and this update is brought to you by Mattress Firm. Spread the word. You can score bonus savings on better sleep during Mattress Firm's
97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5thefanatic.com. The John Kincaid Show with Bob Cooney and Pat Egan continues. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5thefanatic.com. This is Bob telling Pat to shut up. Welcome What's... back, John Kincaid Show here, 97.5 The Fanatic. What is that? I don't know. We're, We're just having week. fun. Yeah, it's no, a Friday. It's not, that's not fun. Christ on a crush, man. That's not fun. That's not fun. When you tell me to shut up like that, like, how would you feel? You John never told saw, you, to, John you told, never saw that movie. Don't, don't you, no, you told John to shut up one time, and he got upset about it, and I understand why. That yeah. hurts my feelings. I didn't tell him to shut up. Did I? You did. And I hurt oh, his feelings, and it hurts remember. my feelings when you tell me to shut up. Well, you, I was playing. I, was I don't think teasing. you were. I was. Feelings are hurt. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry Jim Curtin about to join us 9 o'clock. Hopefully he didn't forget us again today. I just texted with him. Let me see if he responded. Uh, we teased Jim because he was supposed to come in on a first Friday a couple of weeks ago, and he forgot. So uh, Jim Curtin to talk all things Philly sports, but especially his Philadelphia union. All right, Pat had an interesting question before we get to Jim in a couple of minutes, and it's kind of something fun. Now, this week, the highlight of this week, low light of this week, however you want to term it, is Jason Kelsey retiring from the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes. Pat's question to us is, is there somebody else? Yeah, is there anybody else that you think is going to elicit this kind of reaction when they eventually retire that is currently playing in Philadelphia, where there will be such an emotional connection with that person that you're happy in one sense because you got to witness it all, but then you're also sad because it's it's over. And is that person here, or is that person... Uh, going to, you know, you think you you think that there's a chance that, that person develops into that. No one's ever going to touch Jason Kelsey because you know, every story that comes out about Jason Kelsey is uh, the guy is just a, like a Hall of Fame human. Yeah, um, he's like he's a good dude. Like he wants, you know, what's best for everybody, and he just doesn't take himself too seriously. It's like the perfect athlete, and he's also, by the way, like a future Hall of Famer, so that helps as well. I don't want to put people on that kind of pedestal, but there are there are athletes in this town like Kelsey, like a Dawkins, like an Iverson that just they connected with the fan base so much that when they retire, you're like, damn, man, like it's it's really over. And then you start doing the reflection and you spend a week thinking about it. And, it, you know, it circulates and it consumes all of social media. Is there that player for you right now that you might already have that connection with? Or do you think that you could develop into having that connection with? So. The, I, I would say the first name that comes to all of our minds because you talked about someone that you watched their whole time and this could happen with this guy and the level of success could happen with this guy is Joel Embiid. But I think that if Joel Embiid, say it's four or five years down the road and he's announcing it and has his press conference, I think it's going to be more a feeling of frustration than of the sadness or love that you had for Jason Kelsey. Not saying that people don't love Joel Embiid because he is a great personality and all that. I think it's going to be, damn, if only he was healthy, you know, longer than he was. So, um, but that's the first name that comes to mind because I think he is beloved in this city, and rightfully so, Embiid. I think he's beloved. I don't know if he's there. Probably not. Not. To I, I think there's a large portion of the fan base that is frustrated with Joel Embiid, and they, and they recognize that it is not Joel Embiid's fault that he is always injured at key moments. Right. But the frustration and the fact that you haven't gotten out of the second round, if Joel Embiid ends up by some miracle coming back, leading them to an Easter Conference championship, like, it'll go a long way. But when you think about Joel Embiid's tenure, it's not even just missing a championship. It's missing, unfortunately, it's missing getting out of the second round. And I will be the first one to always bring up to John when he points it out, like, yeah, the guy's never healthy. He was healthy one time in the playoffs, and that was when it was the bubble season, and they were completely checked out on Brett Brown, and nothing was saving that squad. Fortunately, that was like the one year he was healthy. Uh, so I'll be the first one to say, like, hey, by the way, like, you know, because it pissed me off when Stan Van Gundy's going on national television saying this guy doesn't show up for the playoffs. Stan, do some research. Like, he's never healthy. I, I think because of that, I think there's a little bit of ways to go with the fan base and towards Joel Embiid. I think the majority of the fan base does absolutely adore Joel Embiid and realizes how special he is, but there is that, yeah, there's something big missing, and it's unfortunate. BG, you got one? I tend to lean towards Bryce Harper, but he doesn't have that off-the-field relatability that a Jason Kelsey does. Yeah, he does all the pandering, and we and we love it. I, I love it myself, and he has big plans, apparently, this season for the London game and, and to sprinkle out through the whole season. 
But it's funny, like, I'm, I'm trying to look at the Phillies team because it's the team I enjoy the most right now. So who yeah. am I going to have that feeling against when he, when he retires? Not Aaron Nola. I hardly knew him. No. It's like, the, 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 the Phillies, the sum is so much greater than the, the, than the parts to me as far as enjoying and having that love and connection with. Like, I love seeing all the guys dance and celebrate after some wins and get together and do, you know, the celebration, like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the big balls the celebration yeah, yeah. and all that. But, like, when I look at individual guys, do I connect to any of them on a level even half as much as Jason Kelsey? And that's why Jason Kelsey was so special, because I didn't relate to Allen Iverson. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I just complete two to completely different lifestyles. <laughs> um, but I, I remember getting sad when the end came and seeing him break down at that press conference and just all he could say was Aaron McKee, Aaron McKee. And it was like, damn, like this dude, this dude was the perfect embodiment of a Philly athlete because he just put it all on the line. So I don't even think it needs to be necessarily that where I need to relate to you. But Bryce Harper was the guy that I thought of, of when it's all said and done, I'm probably going to be really grateful that I got to see his career and he played here because I remember when that article came out in sports illustrated, he was 16. And my first thought was, Damn, it kind of sucks they're not going to get that guy because they're too good right now. Oh, all right. Well, move on to today's game. And then they got him. And, and it's he, like, he picked us. Yeah, he picked he us. us. Didn't want any opt-outs. One in 13 years. Like, he wants to be a Philly for his entire career. And he's also a perfect ambassador for this club. Like, he's everything you want in terms of the on-the-field production, but also going and courting free agents, trying to be the forefront. The fact that he's injured and he gets in the booth and does, like, two or three innings. I know it probably doesn't seem like a lot to a lot of people, but I thought it was awesome. Like, I thought it was, like, really cool yeah, and insightful. He didn't need to do it, but he does it anyway. calculated at times, too, when he goes yes. up there and says he wants to trade yeah. Turner inside that booth, right? Yeah. And in the summer 2019, we're all sitting here like, ah, oh, I don't care if we get Machado or Harper. Yeah. Um, I think things would be a lot different agreed. looking back on it if it was Machado. Like, agreed. we don't and have and all these guys here. Machado's been way healthier than Bryce Harper in his, in his career. Funny. But they, yeah, I mean, Machado's... I, I don't want to say his leadership, but Machado's team as I mean, right now it looks like they're kind of in a rebuilding phase in a lot of ways. So, well, let me ask you this real quick. He, by the way, and he had opt outs, and he did opt out. And he got a contract extension. So, is the closest guy to that right around the corner from retiring? I, I was so I was going to bring up that there was a guy that I'm surprised neither of you mentioned that announced yesterday he's only got one year left, and. It's a guy that probably had the biggest positive 180 I can ever think of in this city where a, lo- a large portion of the fan base didn't like him, myself included. And they didn't then, like him because of, of who he wasn't, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not. it wasn't his fault that he was taken where he was. It wasn't his fault that he was taken and the, the fan base wanted Earl Thomas. I, I don't blame him for that, but it's, it's, it's Brandon Graham. Yeah. And I'm, I'm surprised that that wasn't brought up, but... I think there's going to be a large section of the fan base, man, that goes through it with Brandon Graham when he when he finally, in a year from now, hangs it up because that guy has meant so much to this team, but also this that 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 locker room, and that's what we you know we know that. So I I, I he was he also came to mind. I'm not going to get well like all upset when he retires, but I'll I'll be like, damn, all right, like because it's it's, it's cool for me as a as a as a as a fan that was so Earl Thomas up, right. To be able to go back and go like, yeah, man, you were so wrong on him, and he ended up being a great eagle and all time great, and you're an idiot, and no, I, uh, that was that I was like go a great. That far. It's funny no, he is the, he is the biggest play in Eagles history, yeah, and he's like third on the totem pole for guys we remember from that game. Like it, it's Nick Foles, it's Corey Clement, it, it's other guys, but he has the biggest moment and the most important moment for the Eagles, and he gets outshined by guys like Jason Kelsey from that team, rightfully Brian so, Brandon. I guess. Exactly. Who could forget his pregame speech? Absolutely. <laughs> but he, he, Brandon Graham kind of gets forgotten about sometimes. Yeah, I was, I, I was just I was trying to think of people through my mind, but um, I don't know. We'll have to get back to that. It's a pretty interesting subject. We're also going to do our predictions a little bit later on the Phillies. But right now, we want to talk to the one of the most stabilizing and best coaches in this city, Jim Curtin of your Philadelphia Union. Jim, how you doing today? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being on. Appreciate it. You've been busy lately. A lot of games in a short amount of time, Jim. A lot of airline miles, a lot of travel to a lot of different countries in the, the Champions Cup here, but and also starting our regular season, but really busy. But uh, so far, a good start to the season from the guys. Is that good? Is it good to have this amount of games this early, or do you kind of have to like ease back in any way as a coach because you know how long the season is? 
Yeah, it's a little bit of the gift and the curse, right? We're getting tested in these elimination type games against the best teams on on the entire uh, continent, um, which is good. Uh, so you're learning about your group, um, and, and you're learning young players can you know really step up and raise their level. Uh, but it is, you know, challenging on the you know just the physical side of things. You know, the flights, the travel, uh, the playing this many games this early is there's always injury risk. But we've done a good job of of sharing the kind of the load with everybody and, and uh, everybody's contributing. So uh, play teams in a good spot right now. They're confident. And uh, yeah, we know we can beat anybody, but we all have to be uh, on the same page and, and executing on the field. Jim, looking at the CONCACAF and the MLS season, the MLS season just started and it's very, very yeah. long. And the CONCACAF obviously is, it's, I mean, you're up against it at that point. Yeah. So when you're planning on who's to play and resting guys and whatnot, what kind of takes the priority? Are, are, you, are you coaching the MLS game thinking, all right, I probably should get this guy out now because we got CONCACAF coming up, or is it a vice versa situation? Like, which, which is at the forefront of your mind? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it helps that we have, you know, three teenagers right now that are, are, are young and fresh and, and, and can recover quickly, and they're, all, they're playing a lot of minutes and doing really well. Um, but but you're, you are balancing things. Um, CONCACAF Champions Cup is our priority. Uh, look, if, for those that don't understand, if we win this competition, you know, we're put into a competition next that you play at the Club World Cup. So you're playing against Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, uh, the champions of, of Europe. So that's an amazing accomplishment and something that we're going, you know, all out for. Uh, having said that, you know, you don't want to get too big a deep hole, you know, in your in your regular season play too. So we're, we're respecting that schedule and trying to win every game and get as many points uh, as possible. So, it is confusing maybe for the common fan to be playing in two competitions, but uh, it's a good thing. It speaks to the consistency of the club and how much we've kind of grown. Uh, and like I said, we have some good young players that were developed right here in Philly in our academy uh, that are really playing well on the field too. So it's a, it's a good group to watch. It's a fun team. And uh, it's, it's great to test yourself against the best. I thought Quinn Sullivan was awesome the other night, Jim. I texted yep. you. I watched that whole game. My God, that kid. And I saw him as a little kid. He used to come over to yep. my, my son's high school practices and play with them. So you knew he was going to be something special. But these young kids, and Quinn in particular, yeah. like they, they, have they come along at a faster rate? Or is, 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 is this just who they are? And that, that's what we have to appreciate. So I would say Quinn specifically in the last six months has taken a, a huge step in his development. Uh, like you said, he was kind of you know, this you know small kind of quiet shy kid, and, and he's developed into uh, a man you know, who's, who's physically you know the most fit guy on the field. And, and is, is I thought Bob in the game we texted about it. You know he dominated that game more than anybody and stood out as a 19 year old. Um, and, and for those that don't realize, there's there's 15, 20 million dollar players on the field from that that Mexican team that we play at Pachuca. So, um, big step for him. Uh, you know, it's the, just the beginning of the season. So, I think he's going to continue to get better and better as it goes. But he certainly stood out early in the year. The young young Irish kid Jack McGlynn, uh, who's developed in our academy as well, uh, playing really really good. Nathan Harriel, a uh, great defender, uh, did a great job too. So, it's good to see the young guys step up. Uh, our experienced guys are always going to do their job and do a great job for us as well. And there's a reason and the backbone of the team. But uh, I, I agree with you. Quinn has taken a huge step forward, and uh, it's been great to see. And, Jim, the other night I'm watching the Pachuca game. Yeah. It reminded me of a basketball game. And you're, you're a well-rounded rounded fan of all sports. They were like – they look like a full-court pressing team to me. Every time one of your guys had the ball, and that's, I might be wrong, but this yeah. is what I no, saw. You're right. It seemed like every time your guys had the ball, it was that's your man, go get him, and there was pressure all over the place. It made you guys have to play faster, and I thought, I know you don't like nothing-nothing games, especially at home, but I thought it was one of your the best games I've seen you guys play in a little bit. Yeah, in, intensity-wise, you're right, Bob. The way that that team plays, Pachuca, and they're known for it, they're the, they're the number one scoring team in all of Mexico. They've never been shut out this year. So for us to keep a zero was a, a great, great feat for us. Um, but you're right, the way that they high-press you, it leads into, you know, back in, remember the old Loyola Marymount thing? Yeah. Where it's just like, <laughs> they just want to outscore you, you know? So they they take a ton of risk. They basically high-press your, your defenders. And if, when we play forward, we, we have this moment where we go, okay, we're, we're going at them. And they do give up a lot of chances, but they almost counter your counterattacks. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. a dangerous game to get into. Um, it's about as exciting of a 0-0 as you can get, <laughs> for sure. Um, and now we have to go regroup and go to Mexico where um, we know if we score there, there's an away goals rule where that, that goal now they have to score two to, to beat us. So 
keeping the zero was really important, but you're right. It, it led to a, a chaotic uh, game, and, and that's why they're the champions of Mexico last year. So they're a really special team, and we did a good job uh, neutralizing them. Would have liked to have scored, and we had some chances to score, like yeah, you, you said, did. like you saw. Um, so we regret that, but at the same time, we've set ourselves up for a, uh, a tough trip to Mexico, but one where we, we can beat them there. Jim, unfortunately, you guys are never going to probably get like a, a Messi, which is yeah. is, is disappointing <laughs> in, on many facets because he's good at soccer. But um, <laughs> you, you guys have done such an incredible job, and, and kudos to your scouting department. Like You guys will find some random guy from the fifth division in Tulum, and yeah. no one's ever heard of him, and then all of a sudden he comes over here, and you guys turn him into not only a good player but one of the best players in the league. How involved are you in that scouting department? How are how how like do they come to you and say, hey, we got this guy, you know, Daniel Gazdog in the fifth, fourth yeah. division of Hungarian, and is there something you yeah. can see here, or do, or do they just come to you and say, hey, we got you a player and see what you can do? Yeah, look, we we have three pillars, and I won't bore you with all three of them, but the the number one one is is that we believe any group of of it, uh, of, of cohesive players together can beat any group of superstars. You know what I mean? So we have to find guys that fit our system. Um, and scouting, I don't care whether it's basketball, baseball, football, scouting is so critical because great players, you know, make coaches look good. I'll just put it that way. So <laughs> we've found a way to, um, like you said, mine these areas that are untapped and, and there's bargains and there's guys with a chip on their shoulder that maybe were disrespected and play in the second and third division that are still good players, um, but we see something that we can bring out of them. And we, we bring them into our environment here and, um, we have a good training environment. I have a great uh, support system, uh, great sports performance, great scouting all over the world, um, and these kids kind of thrive and, and, and raise their level in our in our system. So uh, it, it really works well. Um, it's our way of doing it. Um, we're not just going to go out and, and you know buy a twenty million dollar striker because look, guys, sometimes those as you've seen in every sport, sometimes those guys, uh, I'll just say, ego wise and mentality wise, don't make the locker room strong and together you know they can kind of tear things apart so we believe in our way of doing it it's a unique way i think it's authentic and, and i think the city gets behind it and understands it good homegrown players you know mining for really good talent uh, that has a chip on their shoulder uh that won't back down from anybody uh is, is, represents the city well and uh you know on the field they kind of they do their talking on the field is the best way I can put it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that with Jamie Tart at AFC Richmond. You know, high-priced guy, and he just had a bad attitude. <laughs> oh, there you go. Perfect example, man. It happens. That's a real That's a real thing that happens in every sport and every locker room. While they might have all the talent in the world, they can ruin things pretty quickly in that locker room. Jim, the growth of the union has come directly through you, and I, I, I know you'll, you'll brush that aside, but it, that is the, the truth. You are the foundation of it all. And to get into this level of, of, really good, of a really good place, have you gotten to a point where it's like, okay, we're there. Now, I know you haven't won championship yet, but, uh -huh. but like, we're there. You're an upper echelon team in this MLS. We're there. We're going to stay this way. Obviously, you have to do. Have you got a, a sense of comfortability, I guess, is what I'm saying, as to where you've built this organiza organization to be? Yeah. So, look, I, I think that, you know, one of the hardest things in pro sports is to get to consistency where you're, you're a, a really you're a model franchise. And, and a lot of the other owners and GMs are going, they're asking, how do you guys do it? You know, how did you how do you trust your young kids in the academy and this kind of thing? So that's a good thing. So we're a, a very. Uh, a stable, strong franchise in the league. The next step, Bob, is to become a championship franchise. You know, that's that's the next goal for us. We've won a Supporter Shield trophy, which was was important, but ultimately we want that MLS Cup. That's our Super Bowl. Uh, that's our NBA championship, however you want to put it. And we've been about as close as you can get. Um, so now to go from, you know, the, the a great, strong model franchise to a championship franchise is probably the hardest thing in sports. And then to stay there is is really what everybody's gunning for, whether you say the Chiefs, the old Patriots, whatever you want to say and talk about, um, that's what we're striving for. So we're happy, but we're never never satisfied because once you become comfortable and, and satisfied in this league, you get humbled and, and it, it ends really quick. So um, we've worked really hard to get it here. Now we have another step to take. That's probably the hardest step, um, as, as you see in, in all sports. Um, but we're going to you know, stick by our model, stick by our way, Sprinkle in that, that European talent with our great young homegrown players and uh, hopefully lift an MLS Cup. Yeah, I, I talked about, Jim, earlier how you guys have done a really good job of scouting. You've also, and your coaching staff, have done a really good job of developing. 
Who's somebody this year that you're kind of expecting to take that next step and, and be a, a household name? Yeah, so, so Bob mentioned, and, and I mentioned, too, that the Quinn Sullivan, uh, you know, ha, has taken a big step. Uh, McGlynn and Harriel are already starters and have been involved with our national team. But there's some young ones coming up. Uh, Kevin Sullivan, who's actually Quinn's brother, is 14, who, who could start in our league already. You know what I mean? So that gets me excited. Uh, CJ Olney is a kid in our second team right now that has first-team talent, and, and it's just a matter of time before he pops. So there is this nice stable of young kids coming up, and it makes my job easy because these kids are in our culture from eight, nine years old, and they, they see it and they know what is expected of them. The types of players that, you know, uh, obviously Kevin is special and, and, and CJ is special, but a lot of the, the, the other younger ones, the role players, they're the ones that make the coach sleep easy at night because you know exactly what you're getting uh, every time they step on the field. So we have a really good system. There's a great crop of young ones coming up um, that I have the potential to, to help us win now, and, and obviously they, they're all good enough to play in Europe too. So that's my job, make players get better, uh, win some games along the way, and try and lift that trophy like I mentioned. But, yeah, it's a, it's a great setup, and I'm uh, happy to play a, a small role in it. Jim, two quick things. You play a major role. Two quick things before we let you go. One, uh, the Jason Kelsey uh, retirement yeah. speech this week. You're a Philly fan through and through. Where were you? How did you take it in? And is that something that you, I don't know, share with the team at all, or is there no connection there? Yeah, there's a huge connection. Uh, he came out to our game, you know, did the inaugural uh, banging of the drum. Right. Uh, turns out we're, we're neighbors in Seattle. We're about a block away from each other, <laughs> Mr. Kelsey and I. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of familiarity. And uh, I honestly would say, guys, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, has there been a, an athlete that has, like, at a position that's maybe not the most glamorous, that has – embedded himself into a city and has like said the right thing every time done it as talking on the field like i mean is there a more perfect human being to represent the, the city and I, I say that to our guys all the time you know if you do the right things in this town just play hard and give them everything they'll remember you forever you know and that it's, it's true and he's a great example of that uh you know it's emotional when when it comes to an end um you know i i, I think he probably could squeeze out another year or two but it, it it's also, it's also pretty special to know when to, as I say, leave the party, which I'm not good at actually in real life. <laughs> <You know, when, laughs> and me and you both. The time is to just step out and say, you know what, man, I'm still on top of my game. Um, I've, I've taken this group as far as I can. I've lifted the Super Bowl for the city and uh, enjoy some family time kind of thing. And, and you could tell how hard it was right on his face. Yeah. You could feel it, you know. Um, the ankles taped and everything. But <laughs> That was cool. You know, that was cool. So, again, you, he just kind of gets it. He gets Philly. And not a lot of people do, man. You know, a lot, not a lot of people do. A lot of people mess it up. A lot of athletes in the past have said the wrong thing at the wrong time, regardless of their talent. Um, but he gets it. And uh, he's a great example for certainly all my players and, and just really human beings, to be honest. You talk to him. He's down to earth, humble, great person, and a uh, great representation of, of Philly. And he'll, he'll drink for free and eat for free in this city forever, you know, because he gave everything. That's for sure. Now, the, the last thing I'll leave you with, Jim, I'm always impressed. I always look for when I watch your games with your shoe game when you're coaching. <laughs> oh, it's uh, elite. It, it, is, it is elite. Dude, but, long, well, I, one game I went to, I'm texting Amanda from the Union, like, uh, Curtin's shoes are incredible right now. Yeah, he, you, got, <laughs> you, you have a good, uh, a good variety going there. But then the other night, you go with the all black. With a black tie, black jacket, black pants, black shirt. He what stands on business. I'll tell you what, I was... I was like, damn, Jim's, Jim's he's real a, He's tonight. John Wick style. Yeah, what was that but all Chico about? But Chico don't get it. Are, are, are we picking up the uh, sideline attire? A little bit of a makeover on the sideline. I owe Commonwealth proper Philly company, uh, American made. <laughs> I, 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 got, I, got I got my wedding suit there. Yeah, great, great place. And uh, I still rock the – I'm still sneaking. It's always Nikes. Uh, Nike takes great care of me. So it's either a pair of Jordan 1s, highs or lows, or – know some air maxes the old school the old school nikes uh, I, I stick to and i do have a sneaker problem uh my wife will tell you probably over you know up around 300 pairs in it's the not house. a problem that's her problem it's not, not yours problem, jim. jim no <laughs> it's not a problem it's a lifestyle is what it is that's right <laughs> well jim listen thank you so much for joining us good luck tomorrow night hosting seattle and then you're off to uh, mexico for pachuca on on tuesday so we wish you luck in those games uh, safe travels, good luck for the rest of the season, and we as a show will be out there soon to see you. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for the support, and keep up the great work. You got it. Thank you so Thanks, much. Jim. Jim Curtin, man, the myth and the legend. I'll tell you what, Kelsey, yeah, down in Seattle, 
and we've tried to, like me and Jamie. If, Jamie, I think, did meet up with Jim one time. But I, I, I got to get together with Jim and have he, have a beer, too. He's another guy, man. Like, we talk about Kelsey and the story start coming out about, like, just what a good guy he is. You remember the story a couple years ago where they had a, a huge game against, I forget who it was, but it was one of these, like, international tournament games. And they lost. Like, it was 2 nothing, 3 nothing, but it wasn't really all that close. He's leaving, the, the, he's leaving uh, Subaru Park, sees a, a woman and her daughter completely lost, like having no idea where to go, how to – he helped them out, like drove them to their hotel back in Center City. You know, they were stranded in Chester, and he didn't – I don't even know how the story came out. Yeah. But, like, that's the kind of guy he is where they, they, just, got, they just got crushed in a, in, a, in a big game, and he sees people in need and helps them out. Yeah. Like, that just speaks to the kind of guy he is. He's Philly through and through. He like is. Philly through and through is, you mess with me, I'll punch you in your face. But if you need help, I'm there for you, too. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, you I know, give him crap all the time by going to McDevitt, but it's, it's, it's out of love. Like, he's just, he's, yeah. he's legitimately, like, one of us. And I feel like Kelsey ended up becoming that in a lot of ways. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, he's, he's very, very easy to root for, Jim Curtin. Yeah. It, and, it, and, of course, that team is, like, half homegrown guys. Yeah, like, you know, he he may mentioned another Sullivan. Four, what did he say, 14? He could play in the league 14, now? 14, yeah. Yeah, and, and so it's their grandfather who coached Jim at Villanova, who also coached Mike. Like, it's just all intertwined. Yeah. And, and the Aronson boys going off and, and playing. I remember when, when uh, the uh, the oldest one, he was talking about. Oh, Brendan? Yeah, Brendan Aronson. He was talking about, well, Paxson Aronson's coming. He's, he's arguably better. better. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, and that's got to be exciting for a coach, too, to be like, the pipeline that we created yeah. in this area. It just tells you that the area... The soccer in the area is elite. Yeah, it's it's it just special. needs to be developed, and 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 the union have done a really good job of that. Yeah, they they have something really good going on down there. Sean on the cell, we'll check you out before we go to break. What's going on, Sean? Yo, what's going on, guys? What are you up to? Um, I'm just I listen to him from taking my kids to school, and um, I got a little extra pep in my step today. I took the courage to call because. Uh, I got my twin five-year-old sons going to see Zion tonight. We are repping the Sixers, but, I mean, Zion's pulling, you know, the crowd in for us tonight, you know, making that extra step to get some tickets. My kids' first game, um, we're hoping to get down there, you know, by the lower level before the game, like, you know, to see some warm-ups. What do you think? Yeah, I think they let people in at an hour before the game. Uh, you can get in there. They usually allow you to go, you know, stand in the lower level and, and, and watch the guys warm up. I don't know how close to the court or anything you're going to be able to get. But, I'm uh, be holding up my kids saying, yo, Zion, this is their first game. No. But, um, dude, when we got Kyle Lowry, I don't know how this was not the biggest buzz of the entire city. I mean, right away. I found out three days later. Maybe that's me, you know? Yeah, there was, there was reports that he came here. Thanks, Sean. Good luck tonight. Hope you have a great time. I, I don't know what to tell you. you. Found out three days later, Sean. Maybe you were a uh, maybe you were on a bender or something, and you know it just happens, didn't man. get wind. It happens, but that's okay. Yeah. Hey, who am I to judge, right? Uh, yeah, there was, there was buzz a week before he even signed here that he was going to be coming here. Uh, maybe maybe not everybody's as you know dialed into Twitter and stuff. Maybe you know? not. I mean, I'm not going to rip the man for that. He's, he's got family. He's got a lifestyle. He's got. Probably doesn't even doing? know Manasquan got screwed. I don't know. Oh, well, six one zero six. Everybody knows that. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing. So. All right, listen, we thank you on this Friday for joining us here. Nice sunny Friday. Who doesn't like a sunny Friday? Uh, uh, a sad last segment coming up because it's our last one with MBG. But we'll get through it. We'll plug through somehow. want to do some more Phillies predictions. So I'm going to hit the boys up with some of those questions. You have any thoughts on anything we've brought up today or all week, you're more than welcome. 610-632-0975. This is the John Kincaid Show here, 97.5 The Fanatic. Update. One last hurrah. I'm Brendan Gunn, and this update is brought to you by Juicy Juice. Juicy Juice is 100% juice, which means no sugar added and no artificial sweeteners. Just the full fruit flavor that your kids love. Find Juicy Juice at your favorite local grocery retailer or visit juicyjuice.com. While appearing on takeoff with John Clark, Brandon Graham announced that he'll be returning to the NFL for one final season. Derek Gunn reports that BG and the Eagles are in negotiations on a one-year deal that's going to see the Super Bowl 52 hero call it a career in Philadelphia after next season. In other Birds news, there's been rumors swirling of a potential interest in Saquon Barkley. Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds joined the best show ever yesterday, and he said, well, maybe, but only at the right price. I don't see the Eagles spending 10-plus million a year on any running back. 10 million a year, not going to happen. Now, the question you got to ask is, in this day and age, are guys like Saquon Barkley, are they thinking they're going to get a contract worth 10 million a year? 
The Sixers look to bounce back from a brutal fourth quarter collapse the other night when the New Orleans Pelicans come to town tonight. Tip off for that game's at 7 p.m. You can hear that live right here on 97.5 The Fanatic.
John Kincaid Show here on a beautiful Friday, 97.5 The Fanatic. We have a full stu- studio in here. Ray Dunn in the house. I didn't know you look like Connor McDavid so much, but you do. Have you yeah. ever been mistaken for? No, I don't think a lot of people did around here th- know what, before, Connor, who, what Connor McDavid looks like. Before I said it, did you ever get that before? No? No. Okay. Well, you people around no. here, I mean, and down in Dallas where he is all the time, too. Yeah, I mean, be, I don't be, think they're yeah. recognized. He's got, he's got a summer home in, in Dallas. Yeah. So uh, Ray's sitting in with us because it is MBG's last half hour with us. Uh, so we are doing the grand goodbye to her. As we talked about, look, it's just a little side thing. Uh, everybody has people in their office that make them happy to see every day. MBG is at the top of our list. So uh, she is moving on to greener pastures, hopefully for her. Not happy. And uh, today is her last day, yes. Yeah, so uh, we will be saying goodbye to her in about, yeah, 20 minutes. I so. feel like you have uh, three different kinds of coworkers. You have the coworker that tells you they're leaving, and you go, oh, awesome, great. Uh, see ya. You have the middle. It was like, oh, that's unfortunate. And then you have the MBGs of the world that when they leave, it's depressing. It's crushing. Like, yeah, you like seeing them every day. Yeah. They make, they, make, they make coming to work fun. Yeah, the four of us with Ray, uh, we meet every day at 842. It's on Teams. It's, we have a standing Microsoft Teams meeting. Yeah, we, uh, we meet in the other studio. Yep. And we have our handshakes and our hugs and all that stuff. So uh, we're going to miss you doing that with us every day, MBG. And we're going to miss the Apple TV Friday shirt that she wears every Friday. Happy Apple TV Friday. Yeah. So uh, just a little insight into what we got. All right. I told you that I wanted to do. We did some yesterday, but I want to do some more. It's prediction. You know what? Let me get Mitch here. He wants to talk about Sixers real quick. Mitch in Phoenix. You're on 97.5 The Fanatic. What's going on, Mitch? How you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, bud? Hanging in there. It's not easy to talk about the Sixers, especially when you watch other teams. Teams that have power forwards that are between the ages of 20 and 24. Teams that have quality guards. Obviously, we got one of the best, but you need more than one in the NBA. They got problems. Yeah, and, you know, you're going to go into next year, Mitch, with probably only two guys under contract, and that's going to be Joel Embiid, who is already under contract for next year, and you're going to sign Tyrese Maxey this offseason. Everything else is open. And that doesn't look good. Probably not. I mean, it's not a great free agent class. Thanks, Mitch. Appreciate it. Not a great free agent nope. class. He makes a good point, though. Like, besides Tyrese Maxey, where, where's, your, where's, your, where's your guys? Isn't it amazing it's come to this when it was all assets and everything, and now you're literally yeah, going into next year with two players? I, yes and no. This year was built on role players, and you can find those in free agency, so I'm not worried about them filling that. I'd actually be interested to see the, the, the duo of, of um, Nick Nurse and Daryl Morey work together with a free agent class. So, because I really think you you'd see exactly what Nick Nurse wants in a roster, as opposed to, hey, James Harden basically only wants to go to one place, and they kind of do have the best offer. Can you make this work? Yeah, which is kind of what happened. So I, I'm interested to see where that goes. The issue becomes, in my opinion, Daryl Morey, who has been bloodthirsty for a championship before has gone all in, and it hasn't been great at times. An example of that would be Chris Paul trade. An example of that would be Russ, Russell Westbrook. You know, And then the return of getting Russell Westbrook when you traded him to Washington was like nothing. Uh, he got John Wall. Like, he's tried, and he's given up draft picks and assets and all of that, and it hasn't worked because he sees when, the, when, he, when he sees the window open, he gets so excited that I'm worried – that he uses this cap space and he overpays somebody. And we've basically got a Tobias Harris 2.0 in our hands where you're sitting there having an unhealthy disdain for a guy all because they're well overpaid. I think that's where Nurse comes into play, though, Pat. I hope, man. Because if you... I don't like you... not liking guys. Now, look, when they won the championship, Kawhi Leonard, there's no denying that. But the basis of Nick Nurse is, is growing maybe that, for lack of a better term, second-tier group of type of players right so you know maybe it's it's a case where sure you want to go star hunting but maybe it's that second tier group that you team with Tyrese Maxey Joel Embiid that Nick Nurse is really good coaching and therefore maybe the vision changes a little bit I don't know that's why I do I do think they can win next year because I think you already have two stars I think you have Joel Embiid yeah 
And then Tyrese Maxey. Yes. And when you look at the team that Nick Nurse won a championship with, you had Kawhi Leonard, obviously. And then the other star was Kyle Lowry. And then they had a, a, some role players or really good players. You know, I think they got Valanc- or Marcus All that year, Valanciunas, one of the two. Um, you know, they had Fred Van Fleet, but he was a younger player. Yeah, he was young. He wasn't even starting. Like, but he was coming in and getting some, some yeah. you know, key minutes off the bench. Like, they had a good mix of those guys. But it was predicated on the two stars that they had. Well, the, the Sixers had the easy part. They got the two stars. Now it's just time to build the team around them. And maybe that's where Nick Nurse is really and good. You're I, right. I hope, I hope you're right. So I'm not so much worried about the offseason. I'd be worried about the offseason if they had Joel Embiid and that was it. You know, if Tyrese Maxey wasn't Tyrese Maxey, if Tyrese Maxey wasn't nothing against this guy, but if he had the talent level of DeAnthony Melton, I'd be like, hey, yeah, we're cooked. Uh, we're done. I'm not worried about them getting guys here. I'm worried about them being the right guys. Like, to me, this is the last hurrah with this kind of window that I already think is shut myself. But th- this is it, right, for the Joel Embiid era. This is the era where you have to go out there and get the players when you only have two guys under contract yeah. for next year. You have to get it right this time, or that's it. If Maury doesn't get it right, is he going to be here? I know he just signed that extension, but that'll be a, a second year on it after next season. Nick Nurse is going to have his, his input on it, but if you don't get it right, like I think that that's it. And that's and that's my my worry is that yeah, you go big game hunting, and it doesn't work out. You've given up assets to get whoever. You overpaid somebody in free agency to get him here because the Sixers' reality is have never attracted a free agent other than JJ Redick, who they had to overpay. Like they've never been the destination of like, oh hey, I really want to come to Philly. I'll take less. And it sucks no. because this is the only sport that that happens. Every other sport, basketball, I'm sorry, baseball, football, hockey, we've had instances where guys have actively wanted to come and play for this organization, the city, the team. Well, but the Sixers, for whatever reason, it's not it. It's crazy because you look at it, the two superstars, I guess, in our, in our lifetime was Allen Iverson and Embiid. Do we look at them? Are those guys people don't want to play with? Because when you look at the Phillies, they really. had that golden era where they, they brought everybody up. Yeah. But then the Eagles, they had Mike Vick where everybody wanted to come play with him. Then it was uh, uh, Wentz for a year, and now it was Jalen Hurts where people are coming to play with these guys. Phillies, it was Bryce Harper. Everybody wanted to play with him. Do we look at an Allen Iverson and an Embiid saying, why don't guys want to play with them, I, or is it something bigger than them? I, I think, uh, yeah, it's hard for me to. Allen Iverson's different because his lifestyle was like chaotic, and, and, and it's well documented. But like the guy would, you know, go and drink and had no problems like coming in hungover and whatnot. Joel Embiid's not that. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine people don't want to play with the best player in arguably the world. I think it's more of the NBA is the one league I look at where, for a lot of the guys. I don't think winning is it. Like, I, I think winning is nice. But I don't get the sense for a lot of the players in the NBA that winning is the be-all, end-all. It's by design, it's, I guess. And it's the, the brand. It is It becomes that later LA. in life. Yes, exactly. Like, when you're a veteran and you're in the buyout market and you're like, crap, man, I'm 34 years old and I'm 35 and I haven't won anything. Let me go, let me go ring chase. But in the moment when you're a star, it's like, Okay, I'm I'm sitting here in Charlotte. How do I get how do I get to LA? How do I get to New York? How do I get to a bigger market? And Philly, unfortunately, is that little stepbrother in, in a lot of eyes. Well, whereas also, in football, it's like you, the, the Eagles are one of the gold standards. In, in hockey, I mean the Flyers are still a draw for free agents. And obviously the Phillies have become a gold standard. But for whatever reason, and even though the practice facility is is beautiful, and you know, they have like a chef there all the time willing to cook them food and what like it's They've really put a lot of resources into it. They've had trouble attracting guys. And I don't think it's Joel Embiid. I just think it's the way the NBA is. I think it's also because, uh, oh, yeah, the Sixers, when was the last time they won a title? 83. Why can't they win with Embiid? He's always hurt. Oh, that, yeah, okay. No, you're, you're you know, I mean, that, yeah. you know, it no, might, you make, be, might be simpler than we're thinking. Yeah, you make a really good point because Golden State was far from a destination until Steph, Draymond, and Clay showed up. And then all of a sudden people went, oh, I'll go to San Francisco. Yeah, that I looks mean, fun. Yeah, uh, you know, when, uh, when, when Mo Williams was suiting up for the Golden State Warriors and C.J. Watson, nobody wanted to go to Golden State. So you make a good point. You're up to double digits, I just want you to know. You know who C.J. Watson is? I do know who C.J. Watson is. Yeah, I, I know. You know like, come on. I stopped at 12 of names that you brought up did you, today. Did you, write them, did you write them down? I didn't write the names down. I just put little checks every time you brought up a name. Because Pat's great at, yeah, it's like, it's like in 19, you know, 92 when the Phillies traded Amigo Ramirez for the... For the <laughs> Amigo and, and, Ramirez. And me and Brendan look at each other, and we just go, 
What? Sometimes yeah. I have to question myself if Pat's trying to make m me look like an idiot by saying a name that's not real. I'm like, yeah, we need him. Oh, he's, he's the classic guy. Just let him go. He's on a roll. <laughs> but he's probably right, too, so I don't question you at all. Yeah, I mean, Joel Embiid is the equivalent of a modern-day basketball version of Hack Wilson. You guys know. Hack Wilson had a... Gr oh, there was a game I used to play where you spun it on a... I, it was a long time ago. Hack Wilson's home run number was, like, this big. It took, off, it took up almost half his card. When you spun, uh, spun the wheel. He had, what, 56 in 1931? He had 190 some RBI. RBI. It was like the yeah. greatest season ever. Yeah. And yeah. he played He played a couple games for the Phillies. Yeah. In, like, the last season uh, he played. Former Philly great. The Hack useless Wilson. knowledge that we have. Yeah. All right, here we go, guys. Put on your thinking caps because we're going to get at it again with these Philadelphia Phillies. You both have Phillies hats on today, as a matter of fact. So do you. All Phillies. three of us have <laughs> Phillies hats. You know why I wore this hat? Because Mary Beth one time said, I like that blue hat and blue shirt that you have. So since it's her last day. You got to throw it off. Yeah. I thought oh, wait, I'd I don't have care. a Phillies hat on. Oh, no, you don't. I got, you my, the, I got uh, my Frisco Rough Riders hat. Yeah. Well, you have Sorry, guys. Phillies colors. I do. All right. Yeah, Maroon. First question goes to Patrick Egan. He of the birthday yesterday. Who is your saves leader of the Phillies this year and how many? I go Jose Alvarado. And I will go to... 22. Okay. How about you, BJ? I'm sticking right with Pat, Jose Alvarado. I could see if Sir Anthony has a kind of comeback year, which I don't necessarily ex expect, he could compete for that. But I expect Jose Alvarado in the 20s as well. In the 20s. Okay. Give me a number, though. I'll go 20 on the dot because I, right. I do think it's going to fluctuate between who gets it and who does it. It's funny. We all pick the same person, but we all have a low number as far as saves go. Not because we don't think the Phillies are going to win, but, yeah, I think it is going to be situational. I think that's how they're going to go into it. I have them at 24, so it, 20, 22, and 24. It's not even, though, for me, situational. I do think they'll start a, a committee to begin with, and then I think he'll establish himself. But for me, it's more of, I don't think there's going to be a lot of save opportunities because this team's going to beat up on some teams. You think they're going to rake and they're yeah, and, and they're they're going to be up by four or more in the ninth inning, and there's no point of throwing them out there. So I like that. That's why I go with 22 because the offense should be loaded. Oh, I went the other. Yeah, I mean we all went the same way, but I didn't think of it that way as much. Yeah, I me thought neither. I, I thought it like you. Yeah. All right, Bryce Harper. We didn't hit on him yesterday. Healthy at the beginning of the year, hit his power stride at the end of last year once he got fully healthy. How many home runs in RBI for Bryce Harper this year? BG, I'm going to start with you. 36 home runs, 116 to 120. I'll go 125 RBIs. I think he's going to have an MVP season. Uh, he's my favorite right now for that. Wow. A healthy offseason for the first time in a couple of years. He's, gonna, he's comfortable at first base. I think he's going to wow us a little bit at first base. Uh, I think who was it? Jason Sark was on, I think, with Tunis. Going to win a gold glove. Going to win a gold glove. So maybe that happens sooner than we think. I, I'm not calling for that this year. But I think he's going to wow us at first base. I really think he's going to have an MVP caliber season. He's he's my pick to win it right now. Wow. So Jason Stark did come on the other day, and I was listening when he was on. He said, look, I think he's going to win a gold glove. Might not be this year, but he's going to do it. That's how good of an athlete he is over there at first base. Well, and you forget, Amazing. too. Yeah, you forget he got drafted as a catcher. Yes, you know, his hand-eye coordination is elite, yeah. you know, so it really shouldn't come as a surprise that he, he was able to adapt to first base as well as he did because it's not as simple as right fielder moving to first base. you got to look at it like a catcher moving to first base, and those guys usually do transition pretty well. Um, to answer your question, I got 39 home runs, which would be as high for, as a Philly because I agree with, with BG having, a, having a, really a, the first spring training that he's, like, completely healthy and, uh, can can devote his time and he's gonna be big. I have 127 RBIs. All right, I like that. I I bet you do. I'm I down on the MVP home runs a little bit from you guys. I go 33 with 119 RBIs. Um, but if they're gonna rake the way we think they're going to, those numbers probably will go up. Well, if you figure if it it, it kind of depends on who's batting behind them. Yeah. You know, if you can get a bounce back season, and not like you get a bad season, but if you can get a bounce back season from, uh, from JT Romuto, and then Castellanos continues his last season, it's going to go a long way for Bryce's numbers. And then, you know, depending on Bryce's start where he hits the lineup, everybody, it's just God, that lineup is everybody so hits. Good. Every, every, that lineup is so good. Speaking of Bryce and Stott, batting average for him this year. Now he's two eighty last year. You have announcers in uh, John Crook and others, Ben Davis who said, look, this kid is going to win, if not contend for, a batting title within the next few years. Where do you have him as batting average? We'll start with Pat. 
I go with 302. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think he takes a giant. That's step. above what you said Trey Turner's going to hit the other yeah, day. I, I think I think 302. Um, and it's it's mainly predicated on, man, that guy, and I, I said it all, I, I tried to point it out as much as possible. His ability to grind out at bats, that even when he records an out, he's taking a pound of flesh with him. Yeah. And it's really impressive. And you factor in year three, I, I think he's going to take a, a giant step up around. He's going to. I think he's going to hover around 300, but I'll go 302. Okay, I have him at 289, nine points above last year. Where are you at, P? I'm going 295. I think he's right on the verge of that 300. He's going to run into a slump here and there, as all young players do. I think next season is the year he's going to take that big jump that Kruk was talking about. But this year, I expect him to jump 15 points in the average, which is no slight year at all. No, not at all. Uh, all right, talking about guys still growing and getting better. Alec Boehm, I want it all. Batting average, home run, RBI. Alec Boehm, I'm going to start with you, B. Batting average, well, let's see with him. I'll go right around 285. I think that that's what you can ask from him. Home runs, he's never going to get that 25. I, I, I don't think he's going to. Why do you say that? Like, he I, had I 20 do, last I do. I'll tell you now, I, I had 25 home runs. And I'm not, being, I'm not being smart. I'm asking an honest question. Why I do don't you, know why, why do you hate his... Alec Boehm. I love Alec Boehm. I just don't think that's his approach at the plate. And, and like, I think he's more comfortable when he's out there hitting the gaps. Like, yeah. that's what I think he's bound that's to fair. do. Like, and th that's what I expect him to do. I don't know if they're going to ask him to go out there and hit all these home runs because you have everybody else that can do it. So, not that I, if they, but, if they but, ask but, him but, to do it. They might because, don't forget, you're losing 30 home runs at first base. You're losing what Reese Hoskins gave. Well, I shouldn't say 30. People go nuts on but that. But are you, though? Because 26, he was, 27. He was out all last season. Well, So I don't look at it like you're losing anything, really. Yeah, I already lost it. Yeah, I was. it was gone. Okay. Well, I, I was just looking like, you know, last year you're you're thinking he's maybe coming back. But, but you're okay, going to get more out of Trey Turner this year, in my opinion. He's going to hit I the agree. ball much better. So I think you're going to make up for Reese Hoskins' uh, lack of being in the lineup, the, not last year, the year before. In other ways. So I, I think Alec Bohm is going to be asked to do a lot of things like driving the ball in. So I'll say he, he eclipses the 100 RBIs this year. What was your home run total? Uh, let, 18. Okay. So I, I think he'll get some, but I don't think he's going to get 25, 30 like some people want from him. Okay. I think 285, he's gonna, 18, and RBI is? RBI is 101. He'll get that 100. I think he was very close last year to the end yeah, of doing it. Yeah, 97. Yeah, he was very close. 101 this year. I am going to go with 276. 25 home runs, and I will go with 91 RBIs. All right, good solid numbers for him, for Alec Bohm. I kind of like it. Uh, I'm going to go 282. I'm also not going to go real high on the home runs. I'm going to go 23, and I'll go with uh, – got to figure Trey Turner's going to be on base more this year than he was last year. I would think. I would hope. I would pray. So I'm going to go – I'll go right in between you guys. I'm going to go with 94 RBIs. All right, same thing with JT Real Muto before the last question we have for you. Batting average, home run, RBIs. B, we're starting with you. JT, uh, he's getting up in there in age for the catcher. I, I don't know how much longer he can be the BCIB. I don't even know if he's, he's that anymore. I don't think he is. Yeah, I don't think Just he is flat. He's one of the but best ones. I'll, I'll still always scream it. Let's see. With him, I'll go... 291. Wow. We'll get. Uh, I expect him to hit for better average now that he's not going to get the home runs that oh, I expect. The home runs, 15. Okay. RBIs? 80 RBIs. All right. Patrick? I think he hits 271. Mm -hmm. I think he hits 22 home runs. All right. What did you say RBIs was? 81. I go, yeah. I go, I go 87 RBIs. All right, I have his numbers down a little bit. I'm at 271, 18 home runs, 74 RBIs. I think there might be some concentration to give him some rest this year yeah, at 33. So. He doesn't want it. Um, we'll, we'll see. All right, now here's the last one. It's not what you want. It's what is the Phillies batting order this season? Not what you want. What is the Phillies? You don't want to do it? If you don't, no, no, you don't no. Want to I got to get a pen and a paper because I... Here you go. Well, here. Thank you. All right, Brendan, we'll start with you since you have a, a pen and a paper. 
I'm going down right in my You're head. Going down right now. All, All right. right, so I'll, I'll go Schwarber. We're all going Schwarber leading off. I think Reluctantly. that's pretty safe because that's what our man is going to do. I, th- I think the top three we'll probably all have. I don't know. Two two inches. Oh, okay. Me. So I, I I know who you might be leaning towards then because you kind of want him at leadoff. But I'll, I'll go Turner at two, Harper at three. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, hold on, hold on. Uh, you got Turner at two, Harper at three. Okay. Castellanos. Okay. Boom. Uh huh. JT. JT hitting sixth. And that leaves me with. That leaves you with Marsh, Rojas, and uh, uh, who are we missing? Left, right, set. Marsh. Oh, wait. Marsh, Rojas, and. Stott, obviously. Stott, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll go Stott after. Stott seven. Stott seven, Marsh, Rojas. Okay. Which, obviously, I know who you might be in consideration for, two, and I, I like that argument. I, yeah. Uh, I, I got ahead. Uh, Schwarber leading leadoff. Yes. Turner, two. Okay. Harper, three. Uh-huh. Alec Bohm, four. Ooh, okay. JT Romito, five. Uh-huh. Castellanos, six. Okay. Stott, seven. Wow. I, I just, I think they like, I think they like the offense at the bottom of the order. And yeah. The, and all three of these guys have speed. Stott, seven, eight, Marsh, and then Rojas, nine. Because if you can get those guys in the bottom of the order oh my God. to get on base, I, you know, like that kind of negates the Schwarber argument of him coming up, hitting leadoff, nobody's on base. You know, if Stott ends up doing what I think he's going to do, if Rojas can be the, the major league hitter that Kevin Long says, you figure Marsh is going to take, hopefully, a step up. But he didn't have a bad season last year, um, and he, he was able to get on base. So I think they really do like the bottom of their order, having the ability to get on base for some of these, these boppers like Schwarber to come up, you know, turn the lineup over, but also give them the, the threat of a two- or three-run home run. Here's hoping. I, I, and I, and I, I'm, a, I'm a guy that wants Stott hitting second. Like, I, uh, my ideal lineup would be Turner one, Stott two. Yeah, you both have Stott seven. Mine's a little bit different. Start out with Schwarber. That's what they're going to do. Lefty Schwarber, righty Turner, lefty Harper. I have righty Bohm at, fi- at four. I have lefty Stott at five. Righty JT at six. Righty Castellanos at seven, lefty Marsh at eight, righty Rojas at nine. I like going back and forth, especially in a playoff scenario. I would it, it would be intriguing to see Stott in the five hole all year long. Like that that would intrigue me. I don't know if you're getting the power numbers there or anything like that, but he's going to be on base and the whole drive runs in, and at the very least he's getting a good at bat. So I don't hate the idea of that. I don't know if we'll see it. Terrible lineup, BG. Uh, <laughs> way too low for Stott. I'm just reading it. Yeah. Both awful lineups. Chris Miller Thank says, you. I think he's talking about YouTube. Both awful yeah. lineups. I, uh, yeah. That's I fair to I have. Yeah, I don't disagree with him. We're, don't yeah. let, let now. I let's not forget, though. Before, I don't like that lineup that I said. Yeah, before. Well, this was the thing we said as a kid. Did you ever see, like, instead of saying, like, busting on, ranking on me? Did you ever say that? No. That was stupid. just saying when I was a kid. It's horrible. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say, before you start ranking on us. Yeah, that's a we were sa- We were saying what we think the Phillies lineup would be. I don't think any of us would have Schwarber leading off. No, not at all. Okay. Pat? No. Right. Okay. So, so in fairness to us, because that's lo- how, who we're looking to be the most fair to, I am. Um, you, yeah, we're, we're saying what we think the And Phillies I was also going do. a little bit off my projections that I just gave where this lineup's going to settle in. If I think JT's not going to have the best year, I think he's going to move down the lineup a little bit after Castellanos and after a boom. That, yeah. That's what I think is going to happen eventually if it goes the way I think. So it may not be my opening day lineup, but that's the lineup I think they end up with. Yeah, and the, and the good thing about it is for Rob Thompson, you have so much versatility in this lineup. I mean, you could there's three, maybe four different guys. You could lead off a of Harper. You know, you, you there like you could change this around depending on who's hot, who's not. I know he's not one who likes to do that. He doesn't mind tinkering. I was gonna say tinkering. tinkering. He doesn't <laughs> mind tinkering with the middle of the order. But he won't mess around with that top part. No, of it. he won't. No. Like, like the Castellanos thing is a prime example. I put him in the six hole because I thought he, I thought he did really well last year in the six hole. But he, yeah, middle of the order. Like you saw Castellanos hit four, five, and six. Like he yeah. really does. He tinkers with that, that middle. But that top, for whatever reason, man, he just doesn't, he doesn't touch it. No, he's dead set on it. And look, you can't complain when you have a Trey Turner two and a no, Bryce Harper three if Schwarber isn't going well. You, so you can't. And the argument against it is. And if I'm him, I'm probably doing the same thing. If I am Rob Thompson and I have managed the way I had 
got to a World Series, got to one win away from doing another one. Yeah, I don't know if I'm changing exactly. things. Like, I'm a creature of habit as well. Yeah, why not? I've had success. Why change it up yeah. all that much? All right, listen, we want to thank you so much for joining us all week on the John Kincaid Show. We want to finish up. We have to say goodbye to a friend. She's leaving us. Can't believe it. I know. I can't believe it either. Yeah, but MB, you know we wish you the best. Thank We're you. so excited for you. Uh, we realize we'll never see you or talk to you again. Blast, because blast, that's that, okay. blast that vitamin C a little bit. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, a good friend. You, everybody oh, out no. there knows when you lose a good friend at work, it's never easy. So, uh, But we do. We wish you the best. We're so excited for you. I'm not. Uh, you no, speak for Pat, yourself and yourself alone. Pat's heart is broken. I can, I can unequivocally well. say that. But uh, we appreciate you, and we wish you the best of luck in the world. Thank you, guys. I, I hope. Am I know you guys don't believe me, but I'm really, really going to miss it here. Yes, yeah, she's I, been laughing all week. I hope that you... I'm, I'm holding it in. I'm holding yeah. it all in. I hope that you end, up, uh, you end up becoming, like, the, the version of Russell Wilson that, like, you think that you can go off and just and you can do better than us, and then a couple years later you have to come back and go, by the way, just joking. I hope that happens because you, I, you will be missed, and I am yeah. not happy about this. Hey, the Eagles, lost, it well. the Eagles lost their Jason Kelsey this week. We're losing ours today. Yeah. Oh, that means a lot. It. That's a good way to put it. All right, yeah. so we Love thank you, you. Yeah, MBG, you're the best. Good MBG. luck with everything. Too. Our MVP. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for listening. I hope you have a great, great weekend. We'll be back here. Don't forget, set those clocks up on Saturday. Uh, we'll be back on on Saturday, or Saturday, on Monday at 6 o'clock with John Kincaid. We appreciate you. Have a great day. Be nice to everybody. That's a lot of fun, too. We'll see you on Monday. Fanatic Sports Update. One last season. I'm Brendan Gunn, and this update is brought to you by Bradford White Water Heaters. When you need a new water heater, choose one that is built to be the best. Choose Bradford White. While appearing on takeoff with John Clark, Brandon Graham announced that